I only believe in one type of real estate right now. I'm thinking about writing a check for $100 million and paying off $100 million worth of debt. So you might know Ben Mala as being a $500 million man who owns a ton of real estate, but today he is losing $500,000 a month. Well, now I got no protection and now I'm paying $6 million a year. He's a very successful real estate investor who grew up in the slums of Rockaway, New York, and today we're getting an inside look into exactly what's going on in the housing market, exactly what he's buying, and his entire rags to riches story on this episode of make sure to subscribe and hit the like button and comment because it helps us out tremendously. But before we get onto the podcast, I do want to say that we spend a lot of time talking about the importance of taking on proper debt and how crucial it is to have the capital that your business needs. That brings us to today's sponsor, Fund & Grow, who offers a simple and hassle-free alternative to traditional financing. Fund & Grow understands how to help small businesses get the funding they need, even in today's economy. Like getting a bank loan today could be a nightmare. You see guys, there's tons of red tape and restrictions that seem to just exist for the sake of being annoying like your mustache right okay you know with fund and grow i could use that money to create a razor company that you could then use to shave your mustache with their 12 month membership you can secure up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of credit at zero percent interest that is of course without giving up any equity in your company but don't just take our word for it fund and grow already has over four thousand four point nine star reviews and that's because thousands of entrepreneurs are seeing genuine results from that fast and simple funding and as a special offer for our listeners fund and grow is prepared a business funding masterclass that will uncover the five steps to securing up to $250,000 in business credit. And plus, Graham, as an exclusive offer, you'll receive $500 off of their services. So if you want to start expanding your business, visit Fund & Grow today using the link down below in the description and let them help you secure the funding your business needs. Thank you so much. And now let's get to the episode. This is the coffee table. It's got real right, coffee right. in it. Well, <sighs> All right. welcome to the iced coffee hour, Ben. Thank I you really very appreciate much. you coming to Vegas for spring break. Spring break, baby. Why Where not? You take your kids. Miami, right? San Diego, Santa Barbara. I feel like there's better places than Vegas for that. The well, weather is crappy. Here. The Look weather is crappy outside, though. It was freezing. I froze my ass off and then it started raining on top of that. Yeah. Yesterday, I went to the mob museum. How was I wasn't that? that impressed. No? I knew more about the mob shit than the museum had there. How much do you know about the mob? Too much. Yeah. But uh, I grew up around that crap. Mm. You know, my uncle was in it. You know, people Google my was name. He? Oh, shit, it's Ben Miller. He got all his money from uh, drugs. It wasn't me. That was back in, uh, you know, I was like 12 years old. And yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, when you grew up in New York, you grew up around all that shit. Sure. Mob, every, you name every type of criminal activity, I've seen it and grew up around it. <clears throat> And now I'm looking at one. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you're 12, though, how did you understand what the mob was? Did, was did you, or you just you like... You grew up around yeah. it, you know? Your kids in school, you go to yeah. friends, kids in school with your kids, and the parents and the family are all mobbed up, and, you know, it's it's really a very uh, ugly life. It really is. You said your uncle's in the... <clears throat> he, he was, was in the his mob. whole life, pretty much. What right? was his, like, ranking in the mob? What was what he I do? think his name was Benny the Jew. And he would be like the money guy, you know? He needed money to borrow money, loan shark and gambling. He did. He moved a lot of drugs, too, I know that. I've seen newspaper articles. And uh, he's probably spent half his life in the state penitentiary mm. or fed penitentiary or whatever. I didn't visit him, so. I'd see him when he got out once in a while, you know, but I stayed away from that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it wasn't, I always knew that crime wasn't the uh, life for me. Yeah. Plus, I'm not a violent person. You know, God damn it. You know, all that shit about hurting people and it's just, you know, it's it's not, it's not human. Is it is it close to how it is portrayed in the movies? Like you usually see worse. it where they're going to worse. Rock. In real really? life, it's worse. In really? real life, it's worse. I mean, because you never know when somebody's going to come after you or, you know, there's no honor among thieves or crooks and murderers and all that. I mean, it's just all about money. You ever have any close calls or hear about anything crazy that happened? I mean, um, you know, I was around a lot of crap that went on. I was too young. Luckily, I got out of New York when I was 17, and I joined the Army. So, um, you know, I did get in a little trouble when I was young. So, luckily, uh, back then, they would take you in the Army if you didn't have, like, a violent criminal record. And I, I was not a violent person. But, you know, I hung out with the wrong crowd, and you do what you had to do to survive. I grew up in the slums and really lousy, poor family. And, um, you know, so I went to court one day, um, and the judge actually recognized me and remembered me from previous meetings that we've had in court. And he, I never forget the day. Jeez. You know, I'm in court. I was about, I think I just turned 17. And I got in trouble. And um, so I had to, 
the bailiff. You know what a bailiff is? Mm -hmm. The guy that works in the court, takes you away to jail. Mm -hmm. So I had the bailiff on my right and I had the recruiter on my left. I set it up that day where I came to court with the recruiter to prove to the judge I'm going in the Army. If he permits me, you know, gives me, lets me off. So we stand in front of the judge, and the judge goes, okay, big shot, what are you going to do? Because he already knows I'm there with the, the recruiter and everything. <coughs> Excuse me. I swear to God, I saluted the judge. <laughs> and I said, can we go now? And that was it, and that saved my life. Because otherwise I'd be dead. I'd be dead or running away in jail. Negotiating since 17. Probably a lot earlier than that. Mm. That's interesting. I ran away from home when I was 12 years old. I was a big 12-year-old. Well, why'd you do that? Not as big as him, but, you know. Why'd you run away? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> she said a laugh and you cried. <laughs> I came from a very dysfunctional yeah. family. I mean, my mother was very abusive, all right, and she had mental illness, and she was basically a raven lunatic to beat the shit out of you for no reason. Uh, my father, he was pretty much the opposite. He didn't curse, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and he didn't stand up to my mother like he should have. He should have put your bitch in her goddamn place. But anyway, they got divorced when I was young, blah, blah, blah. And um, there was always fighting going on. And anyway, I got stuck with her. And, uh, you know, eventually when I was 12 years old, I was hanging. I wouldn't go home. I'd stay in the streets or go to my friends' houses and, you know, got involved with doing the mischief in the neighborhood. It was pretty rough growing up in uh, New York. You know, in Far Rockaway, in the projects, where it was really sad. So, um, what was your question? Uh, why'd you run away? Why'd I run away? Because it was a horrible place to live. It was a little shitbox house in a really dangerous neighborhood. And uh, my mother was nuts. And she didn't care yeah. when you ran away? She didn't care when I was there. She was probably happy I ran away. And, um, you know, so, you know, I did what I had to do. I lived on, you know, friends in the streets. I sleep on the train, you know, maybe. And we had very long rides on the train in New York. You could get on the train in Far Rockaway, <clears throat> take it all the way to uptown Manhattan. That'd be like a two or three hour ride. So you can get three hours of sleep going that way and going back, providing you don't get robbed, um, you know. But um, Did no adult see you and just... Say, like, hey, where are your parents? Where are you going? No one questioned it. Back, you know, you got to understand, yeah. I'm 57 now. Sure. You know, I'm talking about, I was born in 65. You talk about 1977. Sure. In 1977, throughout the 80s, New York was a sewer. Mm. All right. That's why, you know, Trump was able to do all that crap in the 80s because everything was garbage. It was down, it was crime ridden. I mean, the mafia, the, the, the drugs, the crime, every crime you can imagine consumed New York. It was a cesspool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, nobody ever questioned my age when I was young. It was just something you didn't, nobody cared, you know. And how did you fund your life when you were 12? I mean, you know, <clears throat> hustling, you know. Basically, back then we had what we call a, um, a tray bag. You know what a tray bag is? Mm -hmm. Back then, things were cheaper. You could go with $3. Tray means three, by the way. Mm -hmm. You could take $3. You know the right house to go to. You knock at the door. And you know when you put the deadbolt lock in the door? It's a hole. It's empty. There's no lock in it. Mm -hmm. There might be other locks, but there's an empty hole there. You put your $3 in the hole, and this little bag comes out with $3 worth of marijuana. But... Back in those days, you take the bag, papers didn't cost much, and you clean it up, you roll them up, you get five joints. And you can sell those joints for a dollar a piece. So now my $3 just turned into $5. The Jamaicans had the whole corner on that market, and they were pretty mm. generous. So then you take the $5, and you go back and you get a nickel bag. You know what a nickel bag is? I'm assuming... Five, five dollars. Yes. Yeah. Right, cool. Very yeah. good. This yeah. guy's pretty Turn good. Turn that into nine. Catches on. Yeah. Quick, yeah. So basically, take the five, and really, because I would be such a pain in the ass to them, they would actually threaten me to get away from the door. I keep looking in the bag and giving it back. No, I need a bigger bag. I need. No, it's got too many seeds in it. No, it's got stems in it. And eventually, I'd get a bag where I can get ten skinny joints out of it. So now my three turned into five, and my five turned into ten. And all I had to do was go to the A train and sit in the last car. Because the A, on, the, on the last car in the New York City subway when I was growing up, that's where everything went on. You ever how'd been to New York? How'd yeah. you know you that? You ever been on a subway? Yeah. All right, so the trains are like 
12 cars, 10 cars. How do you know that? Everybody yeah. knows it. Really? Yeah, I started smoking when I was 12. <laughs> really? Yeah, I've been smoking since I was 12. This is like a yeah. common thing. 12 years old? Yeah. 12 is 12? old. 12? Yeah, that's middle school. Yeah, 12 like, years old. 12 is old yes. in New York where I grew up. And basically, you just sell it. You roll it up. You sell it in the last car, the A train. You know, there's always people going to the city, going to work. They want to get a quick buzz before they hit to go to work. And it was easy to sell. And it was pretty safe, you know, in the train. Because so you transact to, in the train? Pretty much. You sit in the last car and you know, loose joints, loose joints. Or I used to do it also in Washington Park, mm. right by the Statue of Liberty, you know, mm. down on Wall yeah. Street. Um, I took a job a lot about my age. I took a job as a messenger, a foot messenger back then. We'd have computers. We used to have to deliver millions. They trusted million kids with millions of dollars of stocks and bonds and deposits to be a messenger and go all around Wall Street. You go to this building, you go to that building, you make a deposit here, you go to this bank here, and that's what I do. And then during lunch, I'd sit in the park and sell those joints. So that's how you sustain yourself. That's really I mean, I hustled. Eventually, I got up to a pound a week. Uh, were you worried? A pound a week? week? That was different. Like that was well, hold on a second. Wait, wait. I was already like yeah. 16 by then. All right. I was selling it by the ounce, too, so it wasn't that hard. Were you not worried about going to jail or like the police? Or? Didn't have, listen, the cops no? don't even. Uh, one time, Weed? I got busted yeah. on the train. You know what the cop did? All right. He took the weed away. He kept it. It wasn't like that. Everything was corrupt when I was a kid. Sure. I was born in a cesspool of corruption and criminals. In New York, everything, you got away with anything, especially if you grease somebody. You know, I mean, it, it was, it's the way it was. It's all about the hustle, baby, the hustle. I grew up with pimps, prostitutes, drug dealers, uh, killers, all that shit, jewel, uh, burglars, you name it, everything. Car, cars is a big thing, stealing cars. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing where I was growing up. So you're scraping by when you're around 12 years old. What about education? Were you in school or anything like that? Believe it or not, when I was very young, my mother was so, she was nuts in one of the ways, but she wasn't stupid. And when I was very young, up until about the age of nine or 10, mm -hmm. from first grade to fifth grade, I actually went to private school because she would go in there and say, oh, I'm a poor Jew. Can you give us a scholarship and let my son in and all this shit? And then it worked out, but I had to change schools every year because Part of the deal was they said, fine, we'll give you son a free education, but you have to volunteer at the school and work there. Well, that fucked everything up, part of mm -hmm. my language, yeah. because she was nuts. So she'd come in there, and the teacher would come to me and says, Benjamin, you're a nice boy, but your mother, we can't deal with her. You got to go. And she'd get me kicked wow. out of school. But then she'd find another <laughs> school to take me in. So I got a good education for five years of my life, and I never went one day to high school. Eventually, I kind of went to junior high for a little while, uh, I got back with my father, my sister. I got bounced around between Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I went to junior high, but I never made it to high school, not one day. I knew how to get high. What did I to go to school to learn for? Hold on, Ben. You know what? Before we go into that, I do have to say that you seem incredibly busy, and I'm sure it's a lot to organize all the real estate properties, showings, employees, contractors, and everything else you have to do. Workflow like this is just a never-ending task. But fortunately, I think our sponsor, Bitrix24, would be able to help you out. Bitrix24 is an all-in-one platform that could replace multiple software tools and streamline your business. Another thing that's crazy about Bitrix 24 Gram is that they're currently the world's largest CRM and project management platform. And the best part, especially for someone like me who likes saving money, is that they're completely free to use. You can manage your projects, tasks, team communications, and more all in one place with one of their over 35 free tools. Yeah, and you could uh, set it up so that you could shave the mustache, right? Looks terrible. Anyways, Graham, from customer relationship management to marketing automation, there is something for you regardless of how big or small your business is. My personal favorite is the project management calendar, which has been an absolute game changer in planning out my daily tasks. Except for shaving the mustache. Okay, buddy. It's available on the cloud, on mobile, or for you techies as an open source software that can be installed on your own servers and is fully customizable. Say goodbye to switching between multiple tools or paying a whole bunch of subscriptions. Everything you need is all in one place with Bitrix24. So try it for absolutely free using our link down below and take your workflow to the next level for good. So again, check them out with the link down below to get started today. And now, Ben, I'll let you talk again. But why stop at weed? You mentioned like pimps and like all these other things. Oh, yeah. why, why didn't you? 
I wasn't a big weed that. smoker yeah. or nothing, you know. I mean, you know, dip and dab, but no, I was more into the money part of it. Okay. You know, but then uh, I saw that if I tried to go expand into cocaine or heroin, like my uncle, he moved millions of dollars worth of heroin. If I started getting involved with that, then it gets very, very dangerous, very dangerous. You know, it's a whole other world I don't want to be part of. Mm. So I didn't go into hard drugs or anything like that. That, that was That's the death sentence. Mm -hmm. But by the time you were 16 and moving, like you said, about a pound a week, like I I know that's like a ton. That is like a Not if you sell them in 61 ounce bags, it's not really. Well, it was it highly profitable? What happened was, you know, I worked out in the village um, where I worked for, I took a job working for a uh, company that was in the clothing industry. It was... They actually own Chaps by Ralph Lauren. Oh. Um, they own a lot of divisions of different types of clothing. You know, they had designers and all this stuff. And my job, we didn't have computers back then. You know what a telex machine is? I used to have to communicate with the feed telexes to a machine that would communicate to Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea. And I'd sit there like an idiot feeding tapes and running copies for people and running errands. And I had a job. But I was around all the designers and the designers in the village. You know, the people that design clothes for Ralph Lauren and all of them. You know, let me tell you, I, I've yet to experience, see too many people that were really good artistically that didn't indulge in some sort of vice. Anyway, they all like to smoke weed in the village. So they used to ask me, hey, you know, we get some good stuff. And yeah, I can get you whatever you want. So eventually, you know, each person would end up buying me, like 16 different people would each end up buying like uh, a, an ounce you know, an ounce wasn't that big. It was a nice little bag rolled up and, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I have about 16 clients, about roughly, give or take. And uh, once a week, they all want an ounce. And I'd have to go to these divisions anyway all over New York to deliver stuff. So I do, I'm doing mm -hmm. my deliveries until the vice president find out. And then he fired me. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're doing that. And then you have the court date, which then. Eventually, I did something that uh, I shouldn't have. I did a, a the, oh, yeah, the guy fired me. So I kind of took revenge on the company and um, got caught. What What was the revenge? The revenge. What was the revenge? For shutting down my weed business. Uh, the revenge was I got a bunch of big tough guys from Rockaway to go and help me clean out my desk. But... We accidentally cleaned out a lot of other desks too and stuff. So, <laughs> what do you mean by cleaning out desks? You, mean you know, when you like get fired from a job, you take yeah. your stuff with right. you in a box and you get the hell out? Right. Well, we did the whole goddamn office. We cleaned everybody oh. out. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was, was the nearby state the building, too. Wow. Anyway, so, you know, right. I got caught because, I, you know, I wasn't thinking, you know, I didn't figure, well, of course, they're going to know it's the last guy to get fired. Right. Anyway, so they put two and two together, and I had brought a bunch of big, giant African-American guys with me to help me. And um, anyway, so I got in trouble for that, and that's what caused me to really, I had to really make a decision. And, you know, the, the judge was going to put me in a real jail for, you know, like an adult mm -hmm. um, for probably 18 months. And um, I didn't want to do that, so I joined the army. And the army saved my life, you know. And the army took good care of me, sent me to Germany, taught me, you know, some good office skills. I actually hustled real estate in Germany too when I was a soldier there. How was that? Because the, we didn't have enough housing for the soldiers, so a lot of people had to rent off base, especially if you had a family. So <clears throat> I hooked up with a the guy was like he was Italian, but he spoke German anyway. He would rent apartments to the GIs, okay? So I was like the middle guy between the, we called the, um, what they call the German market? There was a word for it, the, um, you don't know. You're Polish. Um, anyway, you know, the Germans live in town, mm -hmm. and then I would rent apartments to GIs, bring him, got people that needed apartments to rent, and then he charged the landlord a fee, the German landlord, he also charged the Americans a fee. So he double ended it, mm -hmm. and then he'd give me a couple of hundred bucks every time I rent an apartment out. So I would always, you know, do that rental thing while I was in Germany. <clears throat> what do you learn in the army? What do they teach you? How to kill? No, I was. Yeah. I it really yeah. wasn't like being in the army. I always had right. a civilian related job. What happened was, long story short, <laughs> I went to take the test. To get in the army, you gotta take a test, you know? And where you score on that test determines your selection of what types of jobs you want to train you in. Mm -hmm. 
So I took the test the first time. I fucked it up. I didn't sleep last night. The night before, I was partying. I went and took a test. I really screwed up. The guy gives me a list with like a few things on it. You know, probably, mil- you know, like infantry or, yeah, sure. you know, some dangerous job. So he said, you know, I know you're smarter than this. Why don't you take this book, go study it, all right? Come back in a week and take the test again. And I did. So I took the book. I found somebody to help me study. We studied the book. I went through the thing. A week later, I take the test, and the list comes to be this long. And I said, tell me the easiest job <laughs> that, number one, will help me when I want to get out and get a job, a civilian-related job. And where are all the women at? Okay? Because, number one, I want to be around women. Right. Okay? And, two, I know the women don't work too hard in the Army. So he said, transportation's for you. So I became a traffic management coordinator. So I learned transportation, you what, know, logistics, moving shit yeah, around. It sounds fancy. What What does that job entail? Basically, it's, it was all types of things. I worked at airports, moving troops overseas all the time because we charter airplanes, you know, and then we'd fill them mm-hmm. up with GIs and send them everywhere in the world. Uh, I worked in Germany. Where I was responsible for container shipments that came in to the port. We had to keep track of the containers because we had to pay by the day for those containers to the container companies. Mm-hmm. So the military would run up a big, giant bill. The container would come in off the ship. We'd pick it up in one of our trucks. We'd take it out to one of our posts. Then it had to come back empty, and I had to track all this shit. I also did military moves where we had to go through towns and I had to call the mayor up and tell him we're coming through and make sure we had enough clearance for the tanks so we didn't knock off the side of a 200-year-old building and get a multi-million dollar bill from the town. It was very, it was all types of transportation I did. <sighs> and then uh, I could have stayed that field too, you know. I might have done well, I don't know. Transportation is big money. So, you know, I did that for a few years in Germany and then they sent me to San Francisco, to work in the San Francisco airport because that's where we sent all the guys to the the Far East. You know, Japan, Mm -hmm. Philippines, Navy, Air Force, Marines, everybody. I said, I can't afford San Francisco. It's too fucking expensive. So they said, well, go to Oakland. All right. I went to Oakland, working at the airport there. We had Mac flights. It was less expensive, but very dangerous. I mean, I thought New York was dangerous. Northern California back in the 1980s, was probably one of the most dangerous places I've ever experienced. What made you people feel like were it was different? Dangerous. They didn't care. You could beat the hell out of them. You could put them in jail. They didn't care. And when cocaine and crack hit Oakland, California, it destroyed it. I mean, it was really sad. But I got into affordable housing there. <clears throat> I started. I rented an apartment in a GI building where mostly military guys that worked at a naval uh, hospital lived. Even though I was working at the airport in the army. Um, and I rented an apartment, and the uh, manager there, uh, she gave me 50 bucks a month off my rent just to pick up the garbage around the building, which was a lot back then to me. Mm-hmm. 50 bucks. <laughs> my rent was 500. I knocked 50 bucks off. I already had a three year old, a three year old kid when I got there. I had a kid when I was, mm-hmm. I had my oldest son when I was 18 in Germany. Um, and his mother didn't tell me that, you know, a father was a sergeant major. So if I didn't marry her, I, you know, would have put me in jail. She was only 16. Anyway, um, so I had a kid, yeah. and then me and her didn't work out. She was a nutcase. So I ended up taking him and living on my own, you know, raising him. And to this day, he runs my company. Yeah. Um, so was, she, was she German? No, she no. was American. She was a GI brat. Got it. Okay. So basically, I got to Oakland. I started helping with the apartment building. You know, I got to meet the owner of the apartment building. He was a really cool guy. Mm. You know, he had all the fancy cars and toys, and, you know, he was living pretty good. And I said, shit, I want to be like him. So, basically, you know, the lady, the old lady that managed the building, well, what happened was, um, yeah, the old lady was managing the building, you know, I helped her out more and more. And he started noticing he was doing better. He was making more money. I was helping to clean out apartments, helping him getting turned over, helping him get rented. He was making more money. So I got to know each other. When you make people money, they want to know who you are. So she accidentally fell down a flight of stairs and I became the manager. 
What do you mean accident? Like yeah. accidentally? Well, fell accidentally, she fell down the stairs. Right. It was two story building. It was one of those okay. uh, buildings with a pool in the middle and a courtyard apartments and had 50 okay. apartments. And she <laughs> accidentally. Like, you know, yeah, she I know. Accidentally he like, fell says that. And he's got, like, the corner of his mouth just yeah. turned up a she little bit. When he accidentally says it. fall down the stairs. It was no, a very cloudy up. day that day. I don't recall when <laughs> I was with her. Wait, so was she fine? Was, was she, she fine? Yeah, was she? She was an old lady. She fell down a flight of stairs. That happens. And she couldn't be the manager anymore. Wow. Jeez. It happens. Accidents happen in life. Yeah. You never know. An accident could happen just walking out the door to his house right now. <laughs> be careful, Jack. <laughs> See the corner yeah. of his mouth. <laughs> uh, anyway. So nasty accident. You so had basically, I became the manager, yeah. and I was in the Army. And this guy's doing really well. And then I turn around, and I said, hey, my time's up in the Army. And they actually offered me $50,000 to re-enlist for another four years. But they wanted me to change my job and go into something real military, like bomb finding or something, mining or some shit. Mm. And they wanted me to go to career, and I really didn't want to do that, especially I'm raising a three-year-old kid on my own. So <clears throat> he said, no, 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 no. You, you, you stay with me, get out of the Army, come to work for me full-time, I'll pay you what the Army's paying you and then some, and I'll make you rich. We'll own all kinds of real estate together, and, and you'll, you'll have a great career in real estate. How long did it take <clears throat> up until that moment to facilitate that relationship with that guy? Like, was this like a year in the making? Uh, Three? I moved there, let's see, 83 to 86 in Germany. I moved there in 87. During 80, 1987, for a year, I worked with him. And then in 88, I got out of the military and worked full time for him. <laughs> and it turned out he was a builder. He built a lot of Section 8 housing around Oakland. And he was also building mansions in the hills of, of uh, I don't know if you know Northern California at all. It was called uh, Lafayette, Arinda, mm -hmm. and all these up in the hills in this real high-end area. He was a very colorful guy. <clears throat> and he was real smart. He was into banking. He knew all kinds of shit. But I was the guy to do all his dirty work. So I get out of the Army, and he, I says, okay. And he hands me a big ring of keys. Like the old jail movies would have a big ring of keys. No labels on them, no nothing. Mm. He hands me a big ring of keys and a 38 pistol. And he says, here you go. <clears throat> Gave me the addresses of about three or four buildings he built around town. And I had to go in there and assess the situation. What's vacant, what needs to be fixed up, what needs to get rented. <clears throat> and I did. And I was real good at it. And uh, so I learned everything there was to know about Section 8 housing. I mean, because I learned from the housing inspectors. They're the yeah. ones that taught me. The housing has already taught me how to run because I do inspections with them. I learn the rules and fill out contracts and all that. So I got really good at it. And, um, and then we grew. And then he made me a bunch of promises, and he didn't really keep them at first. So I said, well, all right. I got married again. I had another kid. <coughs> Excuse me. I got to get out of this. I'm living. And then the neighborhood turned bad, even worse. Yeah. What happened was I saved his ass. The building we lived in was predominantly rented to Navy people that worked at the Naval Hospital up the hill. The, the government shut down the Naval Hospital. Now he was subject mm -hmm. to the neighborhood people. He didn't have that direct right. flow from tenants anymore, military. So he's sitting there with an empty building. He could have went bankrupt. But I took my ass down to the housing authority downtown. I made flyers up. <clears throat> I put people in my goddamn car. I drove them over to the building. I take their baby carriages. I put people in wheelchairs in my car. I had a station wagon. It was real cool. I could mm. fold the wheelchair up, put it in the back of the station wagon. I'd take people and I'd do whatever I could to get that place rented up. And I did. So now it became a Section 8 building. But he made more money. It was a rough building to manage. Right. And I lived there. I lived with it. So I created this really rough atmosphere and I had to live in the middle of it. So after a while I said, listen, I can't live here anymore. I gotta move on. You, you know, you told me we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, and we ain't doing nothing. You're building big fancy mansions while I'm here in the hood. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I left them. And I went out and applied for a job with all the experience I had from Section 8 housing. I was worth something in the market. Nobody yeah. wanted to do that kind of real estate. So I went to some big shot company that was building big buildings in San Francisco and had all kinds of affordable housing stuff. And I took a job with them. And I got to, you know, got moved up the ladder with them because nobody, you know, I mean, I, I, I had experience in the streets. Yeah. I didn't know how to just process the paperwork, you know, with the government and all that. I knew how to deal with the tenants. I didn't care. I could deal with a bum on the street or I could deal with anybody. It didn't matter. 
and I could deal with drug dealers, I could deal with criminals, it just didn't matter. I, I mean, you know, I had that type of growing up. I grew up in that shit. Yeah. So basically, I took a job at a company. The company was really good. It did a lot of big stuff. I learned a lot. Worked with HUD, worked with the state, worked with the cities. Um, they promoted me and promoted me and gave me more and more buildings to oversee. And uh, But I, I realized I was only going to get to that one level with them. <clears throat> they weren't going to let me in ownership. Right. And the money's in the ownership. But if you can manage other people's shit, you can own your own shit. You just need the money to do it and the, and the financing. So I saw that these good old boys, they weren't going to let me go any higher. So I was getting a little frustrated with that, you know, stuck at about whatever. I started working there for about 30 grand a year. I think I was making 100 when I left. And that was a lot of money back yeah. then. What year was this? It's got to be early 90s, right? Yeah, somewhere yeah. in the early mid 90s. Really yeah. So here I am. I go, you know, I st oh, so I do. I was, I did save some money, and I started buying little shit boxes in Oakland and fixing them up while I was working for them. So I was starting to buy my own stuff. I buy crack houses that were all boarded up. I buy all the shit on the courthouse steps nobody else wanted because mm -hmm. they didn't have the balls to go in the neighborhood. I mean, there were neighbor, there were places where people refused to own property because it was so dangerous. Um, you ever heard of Black Panthers? The real ones. Mm -hmm. You know, the back in the sixties, the movement and all that. This is like their deep ground headquarters. Unfortunately, they moved away from, you know, helping the community and black people into a lot of drugs and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's very dangerous. So <clears throat> I started buying my own stuff. So what happened? The guy that I used to work for reached back out to me, he says, Hey, you know, I'm losing my shirt. Can you come back, take over my buildings again? And I said, Sure. I'm now a management company. My brother came down from New York, he got his broker's license because he was brilliant, and um, we opened up a little real estate office. Guess where we opened the office up? Across the street from the housing authority. Mm. We are now the Smart. Section 8 landlord's go-to place if you want anything to do with subsidized housing or, you know, or if you, you know, so we started doing management. So we said, fine, we'll take it on for management. He started paying us fee management. And then, he started saying, hey, you know, I got some money. You want to do some deals? I said, fine. But you put up the money. I'll find the deals. I'll fix them up. You put up all the money, and we'll be 50-50 partners. And we did it. And we started just, you know, I started flipping deals. I had his money. The guy, mm -hmm. the guy opened up banks. The guy had big bucks. But, you know, so basically we grew, grew, grew. We ended up with maybe, I don't know, 500 apartments spread out wow. everywhere. More, maybe more. We bought up, because I would, I would, I don't know if the right term to use, but I would pretty much blockbust something. I call it blockbusting. I mean, I would buy a building on one street and then turn around and fill it up with Section 8 and it would get kind of rough. And then everybody else in that street would want to sell to me. I go to the next guy and say, hey, you know, and I tell him, my partner, you know, he bought this building next door, and, you know. It's going to get bad here. You better sell now before it gets worse. So we ended up buying a whole landing no. block for everybody. And I did that in Stockton, California. I did it in Oakland. Um, you know, so we bought up a lot of stuff. But then he got older. And and then um, I knew I didn't want to stay in California too long. I met my, first, my, my present wife. And I didn't want to start a family in California. Because we lived on the top of a hill. I grew. I started at the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. And as I made more money, I moved to the middle of the hill. And then I got to the top, Skyline Boulevard. But you're looking down on the fucking hood. Who the hell wants to be the king of the hood? So I said, we got to get out of California. You know, I was, the lawsuits were killing me. They sue you for no reason out there, especially if you're a landlord. The politics, the crime, I hate it. I don't want to raise no more kids here. And by then, I'm already raising two kids by myself. Mm -hmm. So we both decided, let's go to Florida. You know, I ended up in Florida after my whole tour of duty in California. <laughs> I did a tour of duty in Germany. Well, first I did a tour of duty in New York growing up, or served time, call it what you like. Then I served time in California. And then from California, I went to Florida. And that's my life story. Now you know. And did you continue working with this other guy? We did some stuff together, but then I ended up buying him out because he got kind of old. He didn't want to work anymore. He didn't mm -hmm. want to get involved. How were you able to buy him out? Did you get a loan against his portion? or how? how By the time work? we got to Florida, I had enough money to either... I could... We always refinance. Every time yeah. we bought a building, we bought a building, we fixed it up, we refinanced, and we got all our money back. So now we're into the building for nothing. Or well, sometimes we take more than we got. We'd, we'd end up t pulling out millions of dollars out of properties after we just bought it, fixed it up, and refinanced it. 
depending on how much you know, equity we built up in it by fixing it up. The management's a big key to that because, you know, the ma- a lot of people don't manage their properties right. Okay, they spend too much money. They don't charge enough rent to the market. And that, you know, the, 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 the NOI determines what the value of the property is. So we build up the NOI, we refinance and make money on the deals. And borrowed money is tax-free money. Did you know that, California? You knew that? Yes. Oh, well, very good. Jack's a homeowner. You He's a homeowner. Bought a house yes. a year ago, right? It has oh, been a year. Congratulations. Oh, it's been like a year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah. So, you know, you can borrow money all the time you want, put it in your pocket, and it's not going to be a taxable event until you sell a property. So, there you go. Yeah. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Then I bought him out, and that's my oldest son. How much was it to buy him out? He came to business with me. Um, we owned like two buildings together, and uh, whatever we determined the market value was, was exactly position, you know, I just bought it from him and then um, bought him out, wrote him a check. You know, I had money by the time I left yeah. California because I cashed out. Huh? Ten million, five million? No, it wasn't that much. Okay. I think we I owned a couple of million on each building. We had like okay. three buildings. All together it was like a couple of million bucks. I took over all the debt. Yeah. That was the main thing. It was a lot of debt. Right. All our properties have a lot of debt on them. You know. And then how did that expand through the two thousands real estate bust? Because that must have yeah, after I got rid of him, yeah. I bought up the shit of everything I could. Yeah. I mean when I came to Florida, I bought up everything I could. And then I kind of, it wasn't a mistake, but I did dib and dab in Texas in the Houston area. Mm-hmm. Problem was, I bought in Houston, then Katrina hit. And when Katrina hit, everything from New Orleans and all that shit floated into Houston and fucked it all up. But I bought a thousand apartments in Pasadena, Texas on one block once. Mm-hmm. A thousand apartments all on one block, 100, 10, 100 unit buildings. I thought I was stealing it. I paid 17 a door. But. There's a reason why. All money, you know, all cheap prices, the reason why it's cheap. I learned a lot when I was in Texas. Mm. But my oldest son was already, he drunk out of college. He was in college material. You know, none of my boys were, except this one, hopefully. Um, He came to work for me. And he already started working for me in Florida, managing apartments. So I sent him to Texas, and he bailed my ass out by living there and running everything. And, you know, so that worked out. Uh, we did a lot of shit in Houston too, and uh, we got the hell out. But I did a lot of stuff in Florida, all up and down Florida. And back then, it was money to make because you could buy shit for forty mm-hmm. and fifty a door. You could raise the rent, you could fix the place up, you could trim your fat and the expenses, and you can increase your NOI, and the place will be worth seventy or eighty a door. Talk about the numbers. Mm-hmm. So that's basically what we did, and we've done thousands of them. I can't even count. I mean, I have a resume. I, I stopped even adding on to it. So we did apartments our whole life, all right? We, and then we graduated from the low-income shit to B-class. And then we never really did a high A-class. That was always too expensive. It didn't make sense. Expenses were too much to run them. Mm-hmm. And then what happened was when I married my wife, her, I, I inherited her little sister and raised her like my daughter. She wanted to go to school for the hotel business. Um, <clears throat> all the boys were in apartments. She wanted to try hotels. Fine. She got her master's in hotels. Hmm. We stole. We took her and the professor, who was brilliant, uh, her teacher at school. We stole them from school, and we bought a hotel. And then we bought another. And then we bought another. And now we have about we had half a dozen hotels. And then this guy was so smart. We didn't care. We'd buy anything. Marriotts, Holiday Inns. He didn't care. He was brilliant. So. Um, we grew in the hotel business, but apartments dried up. We couldn't afford them. Everybody got in the apartment game. Mm. So now here we are. We can't find no deals on apartments anymore. What are we going to do? We're selling our shit off at the top dollar. We're making money. What are we going to 1031 into? And hotels are tricky because they're a business. They're not real estate. Right. It takes up a lot of your time. There's a lot of responsibilities, a lot of moving parts. So we started going into retail. So we started buying shopping centers up, Hope preferably grocery anchor type. You know, so we started buying shopping centers, and then we bought up a shitload of them. We owned Publix's, with Dixie's. Then I started also looking at, well, I want to slow down a little and get part of my, you know, it's all about adjusting a portfolio. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting here with 25 assets I have to manage at all times. So here I am getting older. I don't want to blow up in the management side of it. I like the way it is. It's just my kids running it. Let me buy some retirement assets. So I started buying some Home Depot, some Lowe's, you know, big, big name companies where you have nothing to do. It's mm-hmm. triple net. You know what triple net is, right? Very good. Okay. It'll be a test later. So I started buying some triple nets and I diversified my portfolio. We just sold out of our last apartment buildings not that long ago. We sold the Starwood for 90, 
One million. He he said, "Well, take everything." Sure. So he took all my. Who bought it? Um, the guy Barry um, from Starwood Capital out of Miami. He's okay. a big company, Starwood sure. Capital. They sold Starwood to Marriott. Wow. Okay. So he does a lot of affordable housing. He took all our affordable housing away from us, and now we ten thirty one into some more big retail stuff. And I still got a little piece I got to buy, but um. So, you know, I'm always doing the 1031. I'm always looking before the 1031, so I'll have it lined up. And a lot of times, if I find a really good deal and I don't want to miss it, I'll do a reverse 1031. You know what that is? I don't know what it is. I don't know. Is it How just much marijuana have 10... you smoked today? What? I'm just kidding. I think it's probably the opposite of a 1031. Okay, so basically, it's reverse 1031. You know reverse 1031? I actually have never heard of it. Okay, reverse 1031 will save your ass. Yeah. All, right? All right? Basically, if you know you're going to sell something, mm -hmm. all right, and you know you're going to have to replace it, and you have tremendous gains on there, and you don't want to pay it. You want to defer the tax. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can go out and buy the replacement property before you sell. You have mm -hmm. six months, still a six month rule. So instead of having six months to replace it, you got six months to sell your property because you already acquired the replacement property. Of course, you're gonna have to come up with the money to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you know you're going to go sell something for ten million dollars, why wait till you sell it and just start looking? You're under the clock looking, right. and the clock's ticking. Don't. If you got the money, do it beforehand. Do a reverse 1031. Hmm. Now, what happens when you sell your property? You get all the money because you already replaced it. Right. Hmm. Reverse 1031. Interesting. That's what I've done many times. So I'm always looking for the next deal because whether or not my property is sold yet or not, I want to cover that 1031, and I don't want to be on the, the clock, you know, ticking yeah. on me. But this also assumes you have the cash on hand to be able to buy something You got to have the cash on hand to buy right. the replacement property before you sell your own property. But, you know, you can finance it. Yeah. What are you, what are you buying now? Because I'm, I'm, looking actually, all, go ahead. I'm looking at commercial now for the first time ever. So I got some cash. I've been saving the last few years. I wanted to buy a triple net, something here in Las Vegas. Everything right now is trading about six to six and a half percent. Doesn't seem like it's worth it because I'm getting. I could get five point two right now in treasuries. Right. So where's the upside? Right now we're in a weird market. Yeah. All right, and I don't like to get too political, but I think the the government is totally fucked up everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you, you jack the interest rates up, and now we got banks falling apart because they bought into treasuries and all this other stuff that ain't worth what it was. So it brings the value of banks down. You heard about the bank thing going on now. That's all because the interest rates. Interest rates control the world and everything. They control lines of credits for businesses. They control people buying homes. They control businesses, uh, commercial property. Mm -hmm. They control everything. So right now we're in this weird zone. Everybody that owns real estate, including me, mm -hmm. I got a few hundred million for sale right now. It's going to the market. I don't want to swallow the fact that I need to raise my cap rate because it don't make sense. Mm -hmm. If you're paying a bank 6% interest or more and you're getting a six cap, there's no goddamn profit. You're, you're working for free. There's no pr purpose of born being in real estate. Right. You get six percent on your down payment, big deal. Like you said, you go get a treasury for that. You go get a tax-free muni bond, even better. But now the crazy thing is, I'm looking at properties. I'm calling them up, and they say we already have two offers on it. And I say, where are the offers coming? Ten thirty-one. Ten thirty-one. Everything's yeah. ten. right now. The only business <laughs> that's keeping uh, real estate deals going are ten thirty-one deals. That's the only thing keeping them going and keeping the prices down. Mm. Because all the people in California sold all that shit and made all that money. They don't want to pay millions of dollars out to the, the government for taxes. Mm -hmm. They get a 1031 and it still pays. Even though they're not going to be making money on the real estate, they could be saving millions in taxes. I just did my tax return. Mm. I don't know how I made money in 21, but I did. You know, COVID was over. You're going to come back. Anyway, long story right. short, I would definitely 1031 and pay the government millions of dollars in taxes. Sure. So basically, the only real estate, if you want to make money right now in real estate, you're going to have to get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to do that, and I'm just telling you what I'm doing. Yeah. Because I, I, I like to see people make money. You know, I don't understand why a lot of real estate guys hide all the time. Oh, no, I don't want nobody to know what I'm doing. Yeah. It's enough for everybody. <laughs> Okay, yeah. everybody should imagine if everybody succeeded in life. Imagine if everybody helped everybody with a great world it would be. You know, guys like him would have a purpose in life. Yeah, I keep telling him. I keep telling him. But so you, basically, this is what we're doing right yeah. now, Sorry. and you should try to look into it yourself if you okay. can. You gotta. I only believe in one type of real estate right now. 
not office buildings, and you're getting crushed. And you can't repurpose them. If you try to turn them into apartments, it's a nightmare. You might as well tear the building down and rebuild it. With the zoning and the plumbing and the electrical and the bathrooms and the kitchens, it's a nightmare. I've seen guys do it and they lose their shirts. All right, so you can't, offices are dead. Everybody learned from COVID, you don't need to work in big office buildings full of people anymore. Mm-hmm. You can work at home, you can work at your car. This guy probably works on the toilet uh, with his laptop. It's called WeWork. So <laughs> basically, you know, offices are out. I won't look at them. All right. <clears throat> apartments are still too expensive because everybody and their grandma got in the apartment business. Why? Because it's easy. You give somebody a place to rent, you collect the fucking rent. If something breaks, you're responsible for it, you fix it. And what else is there to do? All right. It's simple. All right. So apartments are still way overpriced. Plus, because of the interest rates being so high and people are at an all time low for mortgages right now mm-hmm. and nobody's buying houses. Trust me, I know. I got a $12 million house. I just lowered the price down to 10 and a half. Is that, uh, that's yours? Person? Is that the house I went to? No, 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 no. You went to my new house. Yeah, the where I live. One. I live yeah, yeah. That's the beach house. Got it. Okay. I bought a spec house. I bought a house oh, to fix up a mansion yeah, sure. on the water. Yeah. At the hottest time in the market. By the time I fixed the goddamn place up, they started jacking the rates up and the housing market crashed. So basically, Rent is still going to maintain because people aren't buying houses. Mm -hmm. They have to rent. Well, it's supply and demand. If there's a big demand of uh, tenants, then the supply is going to be cost more money. Simple. So you can't find any decent apartments right now. Okay. The only thing I'm looking at is what I call, you might call it essential, but I call it necessity retail. Hair, nails, food, Chinese to go. Take out, uh, you know, anything that's necessity. Anything Amazon, the internet can't give you. Okay, so I'm buying up grocery store shopping centers or, you know, essential shopping centers with stuff like that in them. Yeah. Find them with some empties that are mismanaged or some old mom and pop type places. Put a little lipstick on them. Make them look like a nicer place for people who want to come shop. Make it look better for the business owners. Fix the parking lot. Fix the roof. Put a little paint on it and fill the empty spaces. Why? Because when you buy them, the empty spaces are free. You're buying it on a cap rate. If you buy something, you're buying it based on what the income is. Mm-hmm. You know why? The cap rate. If it's got empty spaces, you, you, there's no value in those empty spaces. You're getting real estate for free. So you got to go out and find some distressed retail. And then you have to f- figure out how to rent it. You know, don't, don't sit around and find an agent yeah. you know, that specializes in it. Put up a nice sign. Reach out to companies. You know what we do? We cold call. We just scored with a company called Marco's Pizza. Mm. They want to rent three locations from us in our shopping centers all over town. You know, you look at who's growing, what what companies are popping up, but stick to necessity. What Amazon can't sell you and what you can't buy online. All right? Stuff like that. Yeah. What People do you think of doctor's it. offices, law offices? Medical a is a specialty, yes. Okay. Medical, medical, you can do well. Yeah. But it's all about the demand. Is there demand in that location for medical? Mm-hmm. Every shopping center I has has a dentist, has a hearing aid guy has, uh, you know, certain type of medical, you know, things that people like to, you know, you see them in retail yeah. places. Medical office buildings can do well, but you got to make sure you can keep them full. The problem with medical right now is a lot of doctors have given up their private practices. Why? You know why? They can't afford the friggin' malpractice insurance. Insurance has killed the uh, doctor's business. So what they do is they have to go under the umbrella of a hospital, and typically they'll move in wherever the hospital's at and get you know where they are located, and they'll feed them clients, and they'll protect them. So <clears throat> you got to be careful with medical. Medical's great if you could keep it full, and there's a, a need for doctors to to want to have a business in that area of practice. Yeah. I, my, Aaron, he's not he's out of the room, but Aaron took me over and showed me a, a, a technical school where they teach nursing. Huh. Okay, right near our house. Schools are great, but you have to check the underlying uh, money that's behind the company. Is it traded on the stock exchange? Is it a small company? Is it a big company? How their income is? What you know? You got you to really be careful because you know you're talking about big. Some of these places got to pay you fifty grand a month. Right. Well, if you're counting yeah. this guy to pay you six hundred grand a year in rent, you better make sure that company's making money. And, right. you know, they're not some mom and pop rinky dinks going to go out of business. So, you know, you have to check the business's assets. Sure. And make sure that they're strong before you rent to them. And what sort of cap rate do you look for on something like that? Because it's got to be at least an eight to even make sense right now. For, it's just, I mean, you know. then, it's like, is it worth it? If you could get five and a half percent, let's just say guaranteed right now, is it worth it to take the risk? 
for eight. Hey, All water boy. No, he the water boy. What's up? Is he the water boy? The order boy. Oh, you want water, water boy? Hey. Oh, the water boy. Yeah. yeah. I got this for myself because I Uh-oh. usually drink it, but here you go. I don't hope I can trust you. Have you opened it yet? Uh, I did. I don't yeah, know yeah. where it came from. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. getting back to what you were saying, um, basically, what were you saying? Is it worth it? Is it's it like worth it? Okay, the way it's working with cap rates. Yeah. Cap rates, it's a market. You know, everything's yeah, sure. a market. Right now, this is the market we're in. You used to pay four cap for a Starbucks. Right. Now you get them for five and a half, maybe six. I haven't seen six. Not here because you don't you don't pay state tax. Correct. But if you go to a taxable state, you'll see it. Just you Fair see enough. More. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. basically, cap rates are going up. Mm-hmm. What do you do? You sit around and you're gonna have to you're gonna have to ignite, put a fire under their ass. If I see a Starbucks right now and they're asking six cap, okay, and they're not selling, I'm gonna offer them a seven. Mm-hmm. You got to get in there, and now you got to you got to bargain. You got to lowball shit, basically. Yeah. Now's the time to lowball and make the person realize: Am I going to sit on my ass and make believe I'm selling, or am I really selling? That's what you got to do right now. Yeah. So I, I I underbid shit. I lowball shit by at least twenty five percent. Okay, if I see a nice product, you know, cap rates are based on tenant quality and mm-hmm. lo- how long the lease goes out, what your responsibilities are, uh, you know, and, and things like that. So what you want to do is you want to get in there and bargain right now and try to earn a good deal because it's not going to be handed to you, not in yeah. this market. Or do you think it's better to wait? If there's no you got to have to yeah. wait if you can't yeah. make a deal. you got to wait. Sure. Waiting is something but, that But is do you inevitable. think that you could be more aggressive, let's say, more aggressive eight per- let's say, but eight months from now you could be more aggressive than you can today do you think things are going down in a sense that you know sure you could bargain shop today but you could better bargain shop a the year point from is now. but what are you going to do from now till then sit on your ass treasuries. and do nothing treasuries if you're making 5% treasuries. guaranteed but that's nothing. not working i got to work for a living i got to wake up every day and i got to find another deal sure. i got well, a portfolio but, but for anybody else out there who has the luxury to you should always be trying because the least it's going to do it's going to give you the experience and you're not going to be afraid and you're not going to you're going to learn a lot of shit i learn shit every day okay you're going to get in touch and you're going to network with brokers you're going to know who's selling what's going for this what's the walgreens going for right now you got a walgreens over here at a six cap but this guy he's willing to take a seven you know you're learning the market you're making offers it's part of the experience you know real estate is an experience what does he do? I just sit I, here. I'm and still trying to sometimes. figure that out. Yeah. He shows this guy up. roped you in. You're paying this guy for what? I, I, I'm still for his good to, looks. We've been trying to figure this out for a while, trying to get to the bottom of this. I don't know. I'm not gay, but you should be a model. You guys talking Honestly, about? Honestly, you got that look. You know, I'm not gay, and, and I, I don't go that way. But who, who cares? I appreciate about? you guys talking about commercial real estate. This is something I have. I I am the talk about residential. Man. That's the thing for me. It's like I'm 24. I just got my first property. I'm just getting started. So I'll let you guys do what you do with commercial. Because I don't have something else you can do out there right now. You got a lot of big balls for doing it, which I'm looking at doing because I got big balls. At least my wife doesn't say that, but I think I do. (laughs) Um, Converting hotels and motels that got killed in COVID and can no longer survive. The old mom and pop shitty ones. There's always a need for affordable housing. Mm. Seniors love them too. You could take two shitty hotel rooms, pop a door in the middle, rip out a bathroom, pop in a little kitchen, you got yourself a nice one bedroom apartment, but you got to buy it cheap. And you can't spend a fortune fixing it up. So that's a lot, something I'm really interested in doing. I'm going to call it Studio City. All right, take all these old shitty hotels where the hookers go and the druggies go, get rid of them, clean them up, fix them up, and, and make them affordable, decent housing for people. Yeah. What do you think of affordable workspaces? It does seem like there is a need for like a WeWork where people could rent out their own space. I think space it's coming it, back. Yeah. I think it's coming back. Because nobody nobody wants to rent a tremendous amount of office right. space anymore. So this whole community, community, whatever you want to call it thing, it works. But it's got to be location. Right. It's all about the right location. You got to have those type of people in that location. You know, the hipsters and uh, whatever they are. Mm-hmm. And people that, that want to hang out and have coffee with other people that they don't know. And <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Marijuana is legal. You can yeah. have a smoke room, you know? Sure. <laughs> so for the average layman, the person listening right now, if they're either just getting started in real estate or maybe on like their second or third or fourth property, what would you encourage them to do if they're buying like residential real estate? That they're Listen, if you're paying rent, you should always consider what can you buy for the money you're paying rent. All right. Everybody should try to get approved for an FHA loan if it's your first time. And don't buy a house. All right, you're 24 years old. Did you buy a house? Yeah. How much income does it bring in? Uh, 38 maybe. I don't know the exact numbers to be Jack honest. Jack rents at all the bedrooms. Yeah. 
I moved in. I, I, I in almost the third day. So you rent out your bedrooms. Yes. <clears throat> and what services are included in these bedrooms? What services? Some I know prostitution legally. Some here, I so. rented out furnished. Some I didn't. It just you rent them out with I, like women. I, no, no, no. I, I rented it to, to my <laughs> oh, friends. So it's not a whorehouse. It's my friends. <laughs> your friends. Yeah, yeah. So it's like an orgy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That, that, that's I understand Wednesday what you're doing. Night, you're renting yeah. out the bedrooms. That's all. That's cool. Yeah. But, you know, that only takes you so far, you know. But typically what you want to do is, you know, a person out there that qualifies an FHA loan wants to buy a fourplex. Okay? Especially if you're paying rent. Because at a minimum, <clears throat> even with today's rates, you should be able to live free. Where the other three apartments are paying enough to pay all the bills and everything, and you don't pay for anything. So you get an apartment for free. All right, which you normally save somebody fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month, mm. or and then eventually you can say, well, screw this and rent your own your own apartment after a year. You can do that, and then you got four tenants paying, and then you go out and buy, do it again. You can do it with a triplex, you can do it right. a fourplex. Do you you might be able to cash flow if you find the right deal. You think that makes sense in this market? It makes sense in any answer? market. You yeah. got to find a deal. Real estate is all about finding a deal. It's like digging for buried treasure. You know, you got to get a metal detector and find the metal. Okay, that's what real estate's all about. And once you find a deal, everything else is simple. You find a deal, you figure out how to raise the money, whether you qualify or find somebody to help you. It's finding a deal is where you make the money. What's interesting to me is what you were saying about load balling. Because for me, I, I peruse Zillow and everything, and I see like what stuff's selling for. I see what they're asking, and I'm just like, okay, well, this doesn't even make sense. Because exactly. I bought a year and a half ago. The price was a lot lower. The rate I got was smoking. You look like for the stuff that's not selling. You go to the MLS and you look for everything that's been sitting on the market for over 90 days. Or even 60 if you want to get ballsy. Mm -hmm. If it's sitting on the market and ain't selling, better they get your offer than no offer, right? That's exactly what I did. And then at the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to find out what their rock bottom is. They may not sell it for the shitty offer you made them. They might, you, they might be here, you might be here, but you might find a place in the middle of meat. But at least you'll find out what they're willing to take when you lowball them. So it pays the low ball. And then terms got a lot to do with it too. You come in there and you all kinds of strings attached. Oh, I need 30 days to look at the place and inspect it. And I need to finance a contingency and I need this and I need that. They're going to say, I ain't wasting my time with you. You got too many ways to get out of the deal. I got a guy over here with cash ready to make a deal. So contingencies can really screw up a deal too. You want to give them clean terms, quick close, you know, as best you can, and that's it. Hard money. Maybe it's worth if you're risking a uh, five hundred dollars on something to go hard, you know, to tie it up. It's interesting. So the property I live in right now is cash flowing based off of all the rent. I'm How much? Paying. Two, three hundred bucks. I don't know the exact. Jack got a great mortgage yeah. rate though. Yeah. Two point eight. Yeah, fixed. 30. That's great. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And what's interesting is I probably how much, was. You written how many people are written one room? You're not written to one. One no 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 one person per room. Thank God. Oh yeah. my God. It's a five. <laughs> I, I'm picturing him with bunk yeah. beds. No no no. He's no, got no, fucking. No. He's it's got a, the. He's room. got the <laughs> Las Vegas hostel going here. He's got five bunk beds stacked. <laughs> That'd be smart. He's got bed number one, be bed smart. number two, and he goes around. Wake up! Give me a hundred bucks. <laughs> it's rent time. You know, I, you'd like this. I was renting out three. It's a five bedroom. I had one room. Three other people were renting other rooms, and then the fifth room was on the, the only one on the bottom floor i airbnb beat it a couple of times and it had a lock on the outside it had a lock on the outside we, it was a devil on the outside don't know why the previous owners had that but i had to remove that of course before i had airbnb guests stay there but that's besides the point what i was trying to say was this house i was shopping for probably about six months and of course the real estate market was going up when i was shopping it was that time rates were still low which was nice and this was the only property that entertained my offer and this is also the only property that i offered less than what they were asking for every other property that i was in like sending in actual offers for i was initially offering more that's than the house the everybody listing. got killed in right which one it's the house everybody got killed in which one the one, one i bought? bought yeah yeah all right it was I a good deal. That's why I got to deal But it was, the yeah, only, yeah. it was the only property that actually entered okay, my Okay, well, let's get down to the numbers. Jack, it was less. Jack was the funniest negotiator. He would call me and be like, Graham, I'm, I'm 10 over asking right now. I'm like, what happened? Called the owner and he said he had another offer. <laughs> and so I just offered more. Like you were calling him to bring down the price. I had no idea. Price, I had no guidance. So I, I, used, I was telling I, him I would, what to well, do. Let, let's get and down to basis. He, yeah. All right, basics. Yeah. And basis. You know what basis is? Bases? Bases. Yes, okay. Bases. Right. No, not baseball. No. Not those that bases. No. Your bases are real estate. What you paid for it. Okay. All right. So you bought the property for how much? Five hundred and eighty nine thousand. Holy macaroni. Five hundred what? Eighty? Eighty nine. Five eighty nine. How much money did you put down? 
20%. 20%. 20% of 580 is what? Like 125. 125 million. grand you got tied up in this house. You owe the bank another 460 or something, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. So how much is your mortgage taxes insurance? Uh, PITI is 2380. All in. Or, sorry, it's like 23 actually. All in. PI, oh, so if we're talking variable expenses as well? I'm talking about what do you pay for every, you, is your mortgage taxes, is your, is, your, is your payment every month include your taxes insurance? Yes. All right, what's your payment every month to the bank? It's like 2295. 2295, 2300 bucks. Oh, you're smart, you're locked in at a good low rate. So you got 2300 bucks going out to the bank every month. All right, how much you, how much you bring it in? Like 38 probably. 38, 38 for 23 is what, 15? Percent? Or no, $100, $100 a month. A month. How oh. much you bringing in a month? On the house? You you collecting yeah. how much? Thirty eight hundred dollars a yes. month in rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're paying out twenty three hundred dollars. Yes. So it's fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Twenty three yeah, and five is eight. He said thirty eight, didn't he? 35. Yeah, I said thirty eight. So okay, so if, okay, so if the math we're doing is twenty three to thirty eight, yeah, it'd be fifteen hundred. Yes, fifteen hundred bucks yeah. a month. Who's paying the utilities? You? I am. I pay everything. everything. How much yeah. utilities cost? You water, sewer, garbage. It probably brings me up to thirty five in monthly expenses. If we're talking variable expenses, well. what about cable, internet? Who's paying for I'm that? Paying for all of it. All of that. How yeah. much are your expenses? It's, you got water. You got sewer. You got garbage. I guess you got. $100 electric, you got no, gas, it, it probably, you got like I said, cable, it, it internet, goes, sewer. I mean, a landscaper. Yeah. You paint a landscaper. Yes. Well, pool, are you motor one yourself? I, I have a landscaper. It's probably realistically thirty five, thirty six hundred dollars per month is what it's costing me in total with variable expenses. But everything. Yes. Utilities, landscaper. Yes. Is there a pool? Yes. How, pool cleaner included. Yes. So you, you're into this. You're collecting thirty eight, mm -hmm. and you're paying out how much? Thirty five. Thirty five, thirty six. But you live there for free. Yes. Actually, I, I did add a landscaper recently, which is 180 a month, so that might it might be 37. All right, so you're living there for free, basically. Yes. Yeah, you're okay. not cash flowing, no. but you're living there for free, which well, is saving you a couple of grand a month, probably at least. Yeah. yeah, or sleeping in that room with all the stuffed animals. A month to month basis. That's where I'm, used I'm to cash flowing. Yeah. I did used to live yeah. in that room. Yeah, I know. I can tell by the stuffed animals. <laughs> <laughs> But if we include other I things, I hate to like, see what's in your room, Tubby. Like big repairs, CapEx, and all of that stuff, I'm definitely like. He's got a refrigerator so in his far room. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Okay, so <laughs> so let's backtrack. You gave you gave Jack great advice. So what you're saying is, so for example, my wife and I, I'm married. If you could believe it, uh, my she has my condolences. <laughs> okay, so my wife and I. It's uh, okay to be fat, but you can't be fat and poor. What, <laughs> dude? I'm loaded. He's he loaded? loaded. Yeah, you're yeah, loaded, all right. You're loaded. full of it. <laughs> <laughs> you're loaded up, so, <laughs> like an eighteen wheeler. So, so my, my wife and I, I think are in the first position. So I, uh, that you mentioned. So I think I want to go back to that and reiterate. So we're looking to buy a house. We have a bunch of money stashed away now. So you're telling me don't buy a house? Is that like, like we're? You're telling me don't buy a house? Listen, it's different if you got a family and kids and all that stuff. I'm talking about a young person with no responsibilities. At 24 years old. You ain't no kids, do you? No. I don't have any kids. You're gay, aren't you? Yeah. I figured that. So, you know, he ain't got no kids. A uh, 24 year old starting out should try to buy something where he's going to have, you know, make some, you know, live for free at least or cash flow. I mean, if you're stuck with a wife and kid, you ain't got kids, do you? No kids. Thank God for those kids. Um, anyway, I mean, it's different. You got a woman to answer to. You know, it's different. Or you tell her, listen, let's not buy the house right now. We're not ready. But you're loaded. So what do you care? We're talking about people that ain't got money. I'm telling Alex to wait. I think, wait. I th I think now's Alex a good time. Another... It's very expensive now, but now prices are coming down. But guess what? His rent is so affordable. It's way cheaper to rent. We're looking at prices now, like what Alex is currently paying. They wanted to raise his rent like $300 a month. He did get crazy rent. Yeah. yeah. So I said, let's go and take a look. Well, at he's a lot more wearing tear in the apartment than a normal person. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Renting to him is like renting well, to three people. <laughs> <laughs> well, so he gets rid of the security deposit, but we're looking at the other places for rent. They're cheaper and bigger and in a nicer location than what he's currently spending. Because everyone who can't sell is deciding to rent right now. So I think rental prices are so cheap. For what but now's a good time to lowball. People yeah. don't want to sell. Look at what's it's going stale in the market. If it's sitting on the market and ain't selling, then, then you got to come in for the kill. You always start poking the bear. Yeah. And saying, hey, what's this bear going to do? Yeah. I mean, that's the way it is. I just think it's going to get But worse. I can see him in a double wide. Maybe <laughs> make it a triple wide trailer. Exactly what you're saying was the exact same case. Lowballing and uh, it had been sitting on the market. Is the only one that worked out. I mean, so the market's going to turn. We're going to yeah, see. Like listen, that. foreclosure yeah. hitting. The, uh, I've, I've never seen. It always starts with the big giant deals first. Yeah. I'm reading articles about guys that are leaving hundreds of millions of dollars just gone. Banks are taking their hits today. Every day I get a, a, a message or a story, a true story, you know, about mm. 
A bank just took $60 million, $120 million loan. That's where it starts. The signals are there, and it starts at the top. And then it starts trickling down. Eventually, everybody, not everybody had a 30-year fixed rate like you did, all right? A lot of people took their mortgages out maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, all right? They're going to have to either pay them off or they paid it off. The point is this. Anybody that's going to need to refinance is screwed right now, okay, because the rates are so high. And the properties are not going to be worth what they were worth. So we're going to see a lot of foreclosures. We're going to see the shit hit the fan. You just got to keep your eyes yep. out. I read, it was the Wall Street Journal that reported, I think it was 63% of mortgages are currently below, I think it was like 4.5%. It, it was such a low number. It's good. And I think 20, 25% were below 35 But as time rating. goes on. That but that's number. assuming they refinance, because I think a lot of people just want to be locked in, right? And just not refinance. I mean, hopefully they all had fixed rates right. many years ago when they bought the house. Right. But what about the people that took adjustables? Mm -hmm. And you know, you're going to see a lot of it. You see what happened is, a lot of houses were bought up by commercial people, mm -hmm. and they didn't take. They couldn't get residential loans at those long rates for locked in for so many years. They may have gotten five years interest rate low on them. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a lot of shit hit the fan, and I don't know what the hell the home builders are going to do because they made plans two years ago to build build developments, yeah. and they had projections, and now those projections are out the window. And no, but not only the projections out the window on the value, you know, there's no goddamn body knocking on the door to buy them. Right. So you're going to see the shit at the van. It's just kindly creeping in, you know. But if you really want to get a jump on it, get out there and start knocking on doors. Hey, what do you want to do? Your price of property's on the market for sale, but you're not selling. Here's an offer of 100 grand less. Like, I would yeah. take millions less right now than I would have took a year ago on a lot of my properties. I thought I had stuff, oh, I'll sell this Home Depot all day long at a fucking five cap. Bullshit, I can't get it. Would I take a six? Maybe. Show me some good terms. You know what a 1% one, 1 yeah. cap rate is on a $20 million Home Depot? Two million bucks, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Two. hundred grand. No, 20 million. 20, 1%? 10% of 20 million would be... Two million. Oh, now he's going to have me thinking cap, about this. Yeah. Anyway, if it's, a, if it's a five a cap on its one, let's say it's $10 million. Dollars. Yeah. You take $10 million. You buy a $10 million Dunkin' Donuts or whatever, McDonald's, whatever, Home Depot. You buy a $10 million property at a five cap, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to pay you $50,000 a year on every million, right? 5%. Mm -hmm. So 5% of $10 million will be? Fifty thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. I'll collect five hundred thousand dollars in rent. Yeah, that's a five cap. Is somebody going to pay me ten million for a five cap? No, I may have to take a six cap. I need calculating so pencil paper. Yeah, My like brain's over. And it's yeah. hot in here. And it's hot in Nevada. It is it's cold outside. outside. We can't run the yeah. AC in here, unfortunately, because it it it's it picked makes too much noise. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can't have that. No, no, absolutely not. What do we do? He's got to. He's got to sweat it out. Yeah, I just talk it. louder. It's good. It's healthy for your skin. It's yeah. exfoliation. Exactly. No, I think the, the cold is it's more preserving. If you want to take a piece of meat, it'll go spoiled somewhere, won't you? But you put it in the refrigerator, it lasts a while. Figure that out, true. Mm. <laughs> I'll be sitting on that for the rest of the podcast. Um, one of the issues I see with Vegas right now is, as I'm sure you've seen, driving around, there's a lot of homes under construction. And a lot of the communities, they've stopped building. Look out the windows, one yeah. right there. Yeah, exactly. But they've, uh, but they've stopped building. Because they know they're going to be in it for more than what they could sell it for right now. Because building costs are still fairly high. So it doesn't make sense. And they don't want to take a loss in these properties because that's it's a bad comp for the rest of the neighborhood. So it kind of screws them on that. <clears throat> so they're just stopping. Unless they get a great offer, there's no incentive for them to keep building or selling. But and they you know have what so many too? houses like half There's another problem to it also. Yeah. The banks. The banks are worried. The first person to worry is the banks. Mm -hmm. And the banks are feeding them money to keep building. Now the banks are going to say, okay, pull the fire, let's see what we got here. And they're going to say, oh shit, these properties are not valued at what we thought they were going to be valued at. So therefore, the banks are going to get worried. They're going to be have too much LTV tied against the property. And LTV is right, loan value, very good. And the banks are going to come in and say, wait a minute, we got to come up with some other plan here. What are you going to do? And they could, there's always verbiage in your loan documents that say the bank has the right to come in and reappraise the property. And if the property is not worth what it was when they loaned you the money, cough up, baby, cough up. And if the guy ain't got nothing to cough, you gotta, you gotta get rid of it. But now I think a lot of people are assuming the Fed's gonna step in. Because they don't want to be raising interest rates at the same time that the economy is crashing, at the but same time that inflation issue. is crashing. It's not a Fed issue. 
The banks don't want to sit there like what happened in 08. Right. What happened in 08 and crashed was that the banks were sitting on all these goddamn properties, all these loans, and that's the value of the bank. The banks only work with loans on those are their assets. The bank is sitting there with a ten million dollar loan and the property is only worth eight million or ten million even, mm -hmm. that they're hundred percent leveraged. No bank wants to be hundred percent leveraged. So it's 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 a crazy market we're in. But hopefully, you know, the top off stop raising these damn rates and maybe we'll see them stabilize down around five or so. I think it's reasonable. I think the party days are over. I was borrowing money at you don't want to know. I was borrowing money on a one month LIBOR. One month LIBOR was practically zero. Mm -hmm. The bank was charging me a point and a half. I was borrowing hundreds of millions of dollars at one time at one point five or six percent interest only. Now couldn't you negotiate that lower? I was because I negotiated point nine plus so whatever SOFA is plus nine. When? Recently. Yeah, but it's a whole other world. I'm talking about ago, what yeah. happened a year ago. A year ago, Or yeah. two, or a year and a half ago, I was borrowing money for less than 2% on yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars of commercial real estate. Now I'm paying over six sure. because now they got rid of LIBOR because they said it was crooked and we were at SOFA. Sure. And it was something yeah. called Bisbee. But SOFA rate is like what now? It's crazy. Now it's high. It's but, four yeah. something to but five. It, but it used to be If it's point five two, now, yeah, 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 I know. But if it's five yeah. now and I'm paying a point and a half on top of it, I'm paying six and a half. Yeah. Right now, I guarantee you, I'm paying out from just a year ago six million dollars more a year in interest payments, and that's strict interest, no principal. Yeah. Five hundred grand a month, I got to come out of my pocket. Hey, since you're loaded over there, can you make me a loan, Chubby? <laughs> All right, so 10%. that's basically the life we're in. What am I going to do? Cry? No, I'm going to sell off a bunch of toys and sell off some assets that don't make sense, cash flowing no more and try to get my hands in a bunch of cash because the bargains are coming. They're coming, believe me. Now, I, I take it you're still cash flowing enough, though, because you've you got to be I'm around working the bank. I'm working for yeah. the employees, and I'm working for the bank. i got yeah. 800 employees yeah. with the hotels and all the other bullshit. You know, I'm working for the employees, and I'm working for the bank. I'm not cash flowing. Yeah. What little I'm cash flowing probably doesn't even pay my goddamn wife's freaking credit card bill. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, no, I'm not. i gotta, I got to sell assets. Yeah. And then sell them to somebody else that's willing to sit there and own something with no real cash flow. Or they want to type a bunch of cash in real estate because they're in right. 1031. So what happened in the meantime then? Was it just like adjustable rate? stuff that you borrowed on or did you take on new loans? I didn't or? fix my rate. I was a big, fat, greedy pig and I didn't know the party was going to be over. You didn't refinance when the rates were low? Okay, I played a market. Whatever LIBOR was or SOFA, mm -hmm. I paid a bank a spread on whatever that rate is and that rate changes daily. Okay? And the rate was low for years and years and years. Okay? So I just, whatever the rate was, you said it was yeah. two. 0.9 or something, 0.2, okay? I was paying a couple of percent for hundreds of millions of dollars. I could have fixed it at three. For how I could long? Have paid it at, well, with me to Five, go out, seven years? Long, long. It depends on the lease. Yeah. It, every asset's different in commercial real estate. If it's a Home Depot that has another 15 years on it, they'll go out 15 years. Really? Wow. If you have the money like I do to sure. back it up. I mean, you know, it, let's face it. Banks loan money to people that have money. They yeah. give the best rates to the people that don't need it. Yeah, right. Okay, so basically, I could have fixed my rates, paid an extra point. Let's say I was at two. I could have paid an extra point and fixed it off at three. Instead, now I'm paying six. So I got greedy. I should have said, you know what? The shit could hit the fan. Let me pay an extra point. It would have cost me an extra couple of million a year, but it protects me. Well, now I got no protection, and now I'm paying six million a year. So, that's life. Did you? By the way, did I tell you I'm selling my Rolls Royce? You He's did. looking to buy yeah. this one's a bit most luxurious oh, wow. one you could buy. I've I've seen you brand new is seven hundred thousand dollars. It's the EWB extended. Oh, gosh. I don't need that. You, it's like a limo. I don't need that in my life no. And mine uh. is only two years old. Has five thousand miles on it. It's the most beautiful, luxurious car you could buy. And you can get it for, for you today, uh, the Graham Stephan Special is? Tell me. 450. 450. No, I'm not. I can't do 450. Graham, That's come on, man. What about you? Know, this guy's loaded, No, no, no. Right? Yeah, Graham, no, you can actually <laughs> fit in this car. This is a car you could fit in. <laughs> Graham, you can't drive us around in the Ford GT. I'm tired yeah, of no. sitting like this. I know man. you don't try well, to I'm, squeeze I'm, him in a fucking Buy the Rolls GT. Royce, man. I buy can't the Rolls do Royce. That. All the Vaseline in the world is not getting you in a Ford GT. <laughs> 
<laughs> so did you just not expect the Fed to increase rates as fast no, as I they did? did. No, it no. totally, I mean, they didn't think about it. No. It clearly shows that they didn't take the time to think about what the repercussions are. It clearly shows that they're not really business people. And I'm sorry. I'm not really into politics because both of them have good and bad to it, too. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not a Republican or Democrat. I'm a little both. I like the good in both of them. Mm -hmm. But Democrats are typically not business people. That's mm -hmm. a fact. Republicans are, and that's why you can't trust them. <laughs> so right, where are we yeah. living? Yeah. Well, I like to take the good from both, and you know, and and, and just somehow, I wish there was a party that just they just did that, but they can't because people are human, and humans yeah. don't like to get along. Now, what do you think right now about Dave Ramsey's approach? I recently had him on the channel. Is he a chef? Dave, you're thinking of Gordon Ramsay. Oh, yeah. Ramsay. Dave Ramsey, the anti-debt guy. Anti-debt guy. Anti -debt he was guy. wrong, but now he's right. It goes yeah. with the times. Sure. Everything is a time you're in. Yeah. Everything's a market. You got to go with the flow. It's a roller coaster ride. You know, and you got to ride that roller coaster. And you have to adjust yourself to what the times are. No, I didn't, never believed in all that. I believed I was. I would not be where I'm at today if it wasn't for debt. If it wasn't for debt, I would have listened to my father and been a garbage man. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to be a garbage man, hang on the back of a truck, pick up garbage. He said, yeah, you're outdoors, you get good benefits, you get a pension, you live a good life being a garbage man. But no, I wanted to go into real estate and the banks would help me do it. It's all their money, you know? Yeah. So you got to go with yeah. the times. Right now, I'm thinking about writing a check for $100 million and paying off $100 million worth of debt. When I go home, I may do that. But then I have to think about, well... If I do do that, that will increase my cash flow, which will increase my taxes. So me paying $100 million debt may not save me all the money I think it is because I'm in a 37% tax bracket. So there's a lot of things to figure. You have to look at your own situation and figure out what's best for you. Yeah. Do you, think, it, might, do you think it's worth it to buy right now in cash? If you have the cash and you don't want to pay the bank six or seven percent, yeah. and you can, you know, and you can, uh, you can afford to part with the cash and not leave yourself in a vulnerable position, you know, cash is better now. I, I don't want to pay the bank six or seven percent, mm. <clears throat> but I may have to because I'm in a ten thirty one. There's a lot of different factors involved. It's an equation. You have to sit down and figure out what equation works for you. Yeah, like you. How many bedrooms are empty right now? Zero. Zero bedrooms are empty. Mm -hmm. Now, have you thought about splitting the bedrooms? I, making one bedroom into two bedrooms? I'd like to bunk okay. that idea. So how many bathrooms you got in this house? One Three. bathroom. Five bedrooms, <laughs> <Yeah>. one bathroom. <laughs> get in line. Everybody gets I'd a like certain it. time they get to go to the bathroom. Everyone gets a bucket. A bucket. That's better. Mm -hmm. Saves so how many bathrooms you got? Three. Three bathrooms. Yes. Very good. But to be frank, okay, so I bought this property only planning on moving in two people. Just a friend and oh, two friends. And a friend of I a suppose. friend. Exactly. Yeah. That was my plan. The only reason I I, I got tenants in the other two rooms oh. is because I, I liked them. The, the finances of it all, sure, it's nice, but at the same time, I figure like in my own home, the peace of mind, being able to work, work on this, make more money, it's there's a higher ROI making sure I'm inspired in my own home than there is another $800 or so a month. Listen, it sounds like to me you're living for free, which is a smart thing. Thank you. Yes. Now you got to move to the next level and get cash flow. Yeah. Yeah, well, Maybe, if I, if I were to move do, out, I would. You can do like Germany did. In yeah. Germany, it was crazy. Yeah. When you rent an apartment in Germany... Everybody has to take a turn helping keeping the place clean. Like we live in these buildings, you've done in Poland too. The Europeans, they don't fuck around. Uh, he knows. If you rent a, I rented a building when I was a GI in a yeah. building, it was like one, two, three, four, five, six apartments. And it was a staircase, right? Mm -hmm. Every week, everybody had to take a different turn mopping the goddamn staircase as part of the lease. I love that. If you guys so are you listening start, right now, my yeah, housemates, you, gotta do that. I you, would love you should definitely like that. start telling everybody, everybody's got to take turns uh, mowing the lawn yeah. and cleaning the pool, and you eliminated two bills right there. Yeah, That's genius. I'm not going to raise your rent, but you got to start helping out around so here. I, I got a That's question, because like my that. next plan, actually, to be, I, I haven't told Graham this, but I want to buy property cash. But I don't have enough money to do that. I want to buy property cash, but I ain't got no cash. <laughs> I don't have All enough. right, this Dude, guy's got a good plan. Vegas. That's a great plan. Somewhere, somewhere in the South or the Midwest, somewhere I, over Why? there. Why? Because I have enough cash to do it there. Listen, you can go a lot of places buy real estate for practically nothing still. But you ain't going to want to go to those places. You know why? There's a reason why I did nothing. Yeah. Just like when I went to Texas, I bought a thousand years of 17 a door. There was a reason why. <laughs> you can't keep a thousand units full of your own goddamn competitor. Plus, when immigration came in, half the tenants would move out <laughs> and all the other issues. I mean, it's all relative, you know. 
You're going to pay more because you get more. You're going to pay less because you get less. That's the way everything works in life. Hmm. So, and I don't see you traveling far away for what? Make a couple of hundred bucks a month. How much cash you got right now? Tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, including the stuff you stuff in your pillow. Up to you, Jack. Uh, Ooh, like, everybody get ready. He's going to tell um, us how much he's got. Cash? Just cash in the bank. Money that you could, if you cashed in everything, well, if you liquid cash, stocks, bonds, uh, uh, like, your coin collection, I don't know. Oh, stocks you're, you're, and bonds? You're, you're, I don't think you would, I, I, would sell I, stocks. Hey, man, thank God your, your, what do you call it, came back. Hey, your, kind of your, your crypto came back. My stocks? Your crypto came back. I don't think you have any credit. Jack have, sold his yeah. dog. I used no his rich relative. Rich rel I just had teeth work done. No rich relative has left you any money? No. So what do you got? Same. What do you got? Big if, shot. I, if I'm selling stock, or are we talking in a Chase account? How much money can you raise right now in cash? Six hundred grand. Six hundred grand. Ooh, he didn't know that. You're in trouble <laughs> oh now, baby. Gosh. You're not getting paid. <laughs> Wait, <did> he, <laughs> what? Probably, he's been yeah. stashing. You better oh, find out how much you're missing. Okay. And who knows what he's sitting on over there, boy? <laughs> stocks. If I were to sell the stock, turn thing. What? How'd you get all that money? No. How'd you get all that money? Grand? Guy like you, twenty four. This I'm, I I co own it, so it's a it's like a I created this with him, so I would say it's all just a lot of it's revenue from this, and a lot I did make a good amount of money investing. I got equity in my house, which is nice. I live frugally. You count, you you're counting home equity. No, no, no. Okay. no. If I were to make that much of a pocket, you're fired. You're hired. If I were to, the thing is, I, I don't have expensive. I drive an old car. I don't spend money. That's it's good. Thing. You're twenty four. You shouldn't. Yeah. You know. And uh, I mean, so basically, six hundred grand. I mean, you know, technically, six hundred grand is a twenty-five percent down on what? Six times four is uh, two point four million. So you could go out and buy something for two point four no, million. No, why not? It's a bad idea. I think with the podcast. Oh, it's a bad to, idea. To, extremely variable. A lot it of these. A lot of these yeah. episodes, this, we would run like break even or a slight loss, yeah. just to be able to travel. How do you get six hundred grand? You want to figure that out? Well, I'd hire of, somebody yeah, to have. We got to do some. I'd hire accounting. an investigator yeah. and find out if he's personally got six hundred grand under his belt. Yeah. You need to know why. Yeah. And check see what's stolen around here. <laughs> that's. I mean, that's it. That's I mean, but if you do have six hundred grand, but you think that you could go out and buy something for two and a half million. I, yeah, I feel like if no. I'm taking on that much debt, that's literally. I'm not saying Mary. you should, but let's say it was a deal of the century. And a bank was going to loan you the money. You could. I'm not saying you would, but would you know? Put it this way: twenty percent down, twenty five percent down. You could find a deal right now. You got to look and make sure it's the right deal. Maybe you guys should team up together. I mean, he has no. like that times no. thirty. So it no, 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 no. Yeah, no partners for me. There we go. <laughs> So that's it. That's enough on my personal finances. All right. Okay. I want to know more about your personal my finances. My personal finances. Because you are now losing $6 million a year just that's because right. of interest. Can you tell well, us a little bit more about Basically, I got a portfolio and it's probably worth it. I took everything I had all together and threw it all in something. Uh, liquid assets, real estate, maybe $500 million. But I owe the bank half. That's, yeah, okay. That's, okay. that's my story. So, but why not at this point? Sell off the two fifty, pay off the other loans. Let's just assume problem you can have is paying, the problem is. Yeah. Oh, you mean just pay off my loans and keep the assets? No, no, I'm talking about sell the properties to pay off all the loans because we have the evil devil called basis. Ah, uh, okay. And I've been ten thirty one in sure. since I was in my twenties. Mm -hmm. So for thirty years, I've been ten thirty one, and so my basis is very low. Mm -hmm. I could own a twenty million dollar property, and my basis, you know, what basis means. Yeah. I Initial could be purchase. like a million. Sure. So therefore, if I sold it at a twenty million with no profit, even I still got a nineteen million dollar gain, and tax on nineteen million of capital gains is twenty percent. So nineteen million would cost me about four million bucks. It Plus, 20, I got recaptured depreciation. Twenty four percent, the net investment tax. Because a bomber or something raised his. Yep. Own. Is three point eight percent on top of that. That if much. Yeah. If you're cashing up more than a million dollars. Oh. And so, then I may have to recapture the capital gains, I mean, uh, depreciation. What yeah. I'm thinking about doing is I'm thinking about going out, not selling my assets, or even if I do, I can still sell them, and I'm going to do accelerated depreciation. You ever heard of that? I've heard of it, yeah. Don't know what it is. Where I'm going to accelerate depreciation and get the write-off now, but 
I'm not really paying much tax because I got no goddamn income because my interest rate went up so high. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense either. But these are things I have to look at. But if I sell it, if I do the accelerated depreciation and I sell a property, I don't have to recapture it because 1031, you don't have to recapture depreciation. You defer it. Mm -hmm. And everything gets deferred till I die. And then my wife gets stepped up basis. She lives happily ever after. She marries some good looking 24 year old like you and she lives the rest of her life happy. Now, what do you think about them wanting to get rid of the stepped up tax basis? Because, I mean, even as it is right now, isn't that only up to the first? You know, he wants 15? to get rid of the capital gain. He wants to get rid of 1031, right? I don't think they're going to do that. <coughs> I've, I've seen that proposal, but they wanted to get rid of the stepped up tax basis upon debt. <coughs> they wanted they wanted the tax basis to say the exact same. So that, that would, when that, that person would kill, sells. That would crush a lot of widows. But don't you feel they have to like, raise the money to pay the tax and sell the property. No, but that's assuming they sell. Basically, and the tax bill could be more than the gain. No, basically what they're saying is that, that your tax basis would transfer to, let's say, your heir. Right. And then if they were to sell, then they pay based on your tax basis of the property, not theirs. That would be a lot more taxes for them to pay. Correct. So they if would, they, they were to sell. They would end up with nothing. But that's if they were to sell. The best thing to do yeah. is if he wants to get rid of 1031, that's fine. If you want to get rid of it, get rid of it. But it's going to stop a lot of growth. People aren't going to grow as much. Mm -hmm. And then you have to give me stepped up basis. All right, because at least I'll be saved. I'll just mm -hmm. sell everything at stepped up basis and not have to worry about paying tax because I'm selling what mm -hmm. the market price is. It's complicated. What happened to one I had? What happened to one I had? You, you, drink, you, keep, you keep drinking. I drink it all. Oh, well, yeah. it's hot as fuck in here. Do you want it's it? Not, I didn't know hot. this was going to be. It's really this ain't the fucking hot. iced coffee. This is the fucking hot box. <laughs> this is the, this is the fucking the sauna hot, hour. The coffee. Come the hang coffee. out in Graham Stephan's <laughs> sauna box. So how much does it cost? Because your house is massive. What is the house? What is the value of the house? Uh, right now, it's selling for 30 million. 30 no. million. It costs 32 to build. No, I thought you. I bought you it paid, for sixteen. You bought it for sixteen. Yeah, but I bought it from a ball player that lost his contract and his career is over and yeah, whatever. Right. And he needed to sell it. I bought it for fifty cents in a dollar. I didn't want that house. I hated that house. I hate that house. I like my old house. It was a strictly investment. But it was decision? a fifty cents in a not, deal. It was a brand not, new house. Fifty then, cents in a deal. Why you, not sell irreplaceable. This house? You can't find three lots in Bel Air Beach. Impossible in the Gulf of Mexico. Why, why not sell it and move to the other house? My wife has offered me that opportunity, but I don't yeah. want to move for a nice house with all the gadgets to some older house. Yeah. And then she's going to want to tear that fucking house apart and drive me nuts fixing it up. Yeah. It's not for me. I'd rather just, my house I could sell for 30. The Scientologists offered me 29 once, I think. Really? <laughs> when yeah. to use it as one of their headquarters? I don't know. Office, Maybe stick, or? who the hell knows? They got goggles of money. But um, anyway, my house should be worth about thirty million, even in a bad market. So what's that cost just off of like the three lots? Yeah, but like twenty thousand square feet, in and out. The uh, like if you're if you're talking about like all of the variable expenses of owning a thirty million dollar house. Like Luckily, I was the only water. thing I was smart on was my mortgage. Mm. I fixed my rate at two percent. I got a mortgage on my house. I got an eighty percent jumbo loan at two percent. Fixed rate for, for like years? fifteen years. Sure. Fifteen years, interest only, baby. Oh, interest wow. only and the other house i got 1.87 on that other house it's wow. my second home but I'm so what's your it. payment every month on that well two percent on about i bought the house 16 million put 20 percent out put about three million down over 15 million right no i owe 16 million from three 13 million 13 million times two percent it's about 20 grand a month mm. and then no. i got housekeep yeah 20 what grand a month Get a calculator out. Where's your phone at? 20, 13 so, million. Yeah, you're right. Times so 2% divided your, by yeah, 12. Yeah, yeah. It's about 20 grand a month. Yeah. But then, you know, I got Property a big electric taxes, bill. Yeah. You taxes gotta heat the pool. Ass. Yeah, so what? Taxes kick my ass. Taxes are about 130, 40 grand a year or more. That's still not terrible, <clears throat> about a percent. Now, what about well, insurance because it's right not valued now, at yeah. the house. It's valued at what he built, what he paid yeah, to build it and sure. land. And, you know, he didn't tell me what he paid to build it. Yeah. Anyway, it's, um, you know, altogether, you know, it probably cost me about whatever. Forty grand a month to live there with housekeepers and utilities. That's and not bad at all. I, I I lowered my landscaping bill. I swear to God, I hated my landscaper. He was giving me fucking. Oh, we gotta replace this. We gotta fix that. We gotta do this bullshit. I got rid of my landscaper. I replaced all the lawns with fake grass, and I love it. Yeah. I gave my kid a putt putt thing, and I cut out the fucking landscaper. I fired the pool company. Got the guy from the hotel. It does my Clearwater Beach Hotel come do it. Nice. I've been cutting expenses. <laughs> what about now? What about insurance? Because I heard Florida. My, insurance we just renewed. Me. I only renewed it for five dollars, five million worth of damage. Okay. Um, so my insurance is like twenty four grand a year. My son just called me today on it. Yeah. And then flood is no big flood is the maximum what you get on flood anyway. You sure. don't, you know. 
And then the house is built to where if it floods, all the walls somehow, I don't know, something happens where it protects the house. It's only the lower level, only the bowling alley, and it gets destroyed. Got it. Huh. That's good to know. <laughs> Only the bowling alley. I don't fucking care about the bowling alley. Yeah, who cares about a bowling alley? A bunch of balls, a bunch of shoes, and a fucking couple of lanes of bowling. When's the last time you used the bowling alley in your house? The last time? The last time is when I pulled my back out from bowling. So it's been a while. I don't do, I don't, I used to bowl as a kid, but no, it's for kids. So uh, how many square feet is the house? 20,000 in and 20,000 patio. Okay, so 40,000 square feet. What not, percent? Not square, not heated. Sure. Well, the garages are air conditioned here, but they don't count. What percent of this 40,000 square foot place do you think you actually use most? 200. Of the 200. The bed? No. I mean, my bedroom, you know, it's pretty big, but, you know, the bedroom. I basically live in my bedroom and my office. Does the elevator count the square footage? Yeah. I use sure. the elevator a lot. Uh, I use the feet. office, yeah. use the elevator, and then she calls me in to eat. Yeah. And otherwise, the rest of the house is for the kids. That's crazy, because yeah. for me, I just wonder, like, why would anyone need that big I know, but I it mean, was a deal, baby. It's my, it's my like, insurance policy. If all shit goes to smart. hell, yeah. I can put it on the market tomorrow. I know I get at least 28 even in this yeah. market. I only paid, I only owe the bank how much? Uh, I said 13. 13. Yeah. I could go get 15 million bucks in, uh, if I need it out of my house. That makes sense. It was sense. an investment, smart. you know? Yeah. Can you tell us the details about the plane you bought? Because you bought a new plane, didn't you, recently? I own partnerships. I'm a partner in about three different planes. Sure. Okay, I don't want to own my own plane. It's just crazy. The bills, one part broke the other day was 20 grand, and that was a cheap part. <laughs> I mean, basically, I have partners, and none of us ever have any conflicts with using them. You know, you want to use the plane, you call up the guy to manage it. Hey, I want to use the plane, go here, go there, whatever. And then um, we all share in the maintenance costs every month. We all share where you pay whatever hours you use. Mm -hmm. You know, whoever, whatever, whatever partner uses X amount of hours pays the hourly engine service based on his hours. You, you, as soon as you're done using the pain, you got to write a check to the pilots and the gas and any other fees and landing yeah. fees. And then if it breaks, we all got to split the bill. Yeah. But I got four guys to split the bill with when it comes in. We had to get our damn plane painted the other day. It cost like 80 grand. So yeah, because it it's a special type of paint, right? That has to get approved, and that's like this, a special uh, the, process. They claim that the reason why is because right. my plane, my plane, the the one we're talking about is a um, <clears throat> who's Aaron here? He knew all this shit. It's a what's it called? Beach Jet Premier, okay? And it's made out of compound or pounds, pose. Anyway, um, it's not like a metal yeah. plane. It had to go somewhere special. Blah 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 for cracks. It cost eighty grand to paint a fucking wow. plane. You could have done it for twenty. But yeah. Man, I could have. Well, if it was a regular plane and if I was a local yokel, but they want to go to a big shot place and all that. Anyway, so at least it cost me 20 out of the 80 because I got four partners, yeah. three other partners. How much was the plane? We paid about a million and a half for it. We didn't pay much. We were yeah. going to be a, The guy that's one of my partners is like an expert in buying shit. Carl, sure. he owns an auction business. One plane cost a million and a half. The other one cost like a million eight. The other one's a G100 I never used because it's too expensive. Takes two pilots. The premier only takes one pilot, mm. and it's for long distance, you know. But certain partners use uh, certain planes more depending on the lifestyle. But I got that, and then I got the prop plane, the four fourteen, that I use now because I'm being a cheapskate, and I make my kids use that to bounce around Florida. So I, but that's only good for Florida. I, <clears throat> I saw a clip of you breaking your private jet. No, you probably saw the prop plane where I got on and it tilted down. Well, that was that was that was for yeah. the uh, that was for the clip. That was for the TikTok clip right there. That's oh, my yeah. question was for that. Plane, yeah. yeah, yeah. Could you elaborate? What was elaborate? that? Elaborate. Well, the guy or something. I don't know. Maybe have the plane blocked right or whatever. Or maybe there's a certain way you're supposed to load a plane. But when I got on a plane, oh, the whole front <laughs> went up. And it was true. It happened. And um, it did damage. No, it didn't do damage. None. No. <laughs> it just tilted in the bottom, the tail hit the ground. I mean, you'd think though, with something as delicate the, yeah. as a plane that that would like incur. Planes aren't that delicate. They're made out of like cars, like aluminum, or metal, sheet metal, whatever. I mean, couldn't you, know. you just get someone in the front of the plane too, like load an extra few people to sit in front, balance it, or no? We balance when we yeah. sit in the plane. Normally, we make our files sit with the pilot up front. Yeah. Two planes. So, how much would it cost you then to make the average trip on a plane like that? Basically, what I do a lot is I go to Fort Lauderdale, which is about 250 miles. If I take the prop plane, I got to pay for a pilot. He's about 800 bucks a day, even if he's only working two hours. You got to pay him for a day. So you got 800 bucks for the pilot, okay? And then it's going to run me 
about, and that plane, it's going to run me $500 in gas to go 250 miles in the prop plane and 500 back in fuel. Mm -hmm. So I got a thousand bucks in fuel and I got $800 in the pilots, $1,800. If I take the premier jet, it's going to be about $700 more for the fuel. And if I take the G100, it's going to be about seventeen, two thousand more because you use more fuel and then you're the pilot. Hmm. It's interesting. It's the same distance between here and LA. Yeah. Hmm. Every plane is yeah. different, you know. But then you got the engine hours you got to pay for too. Sure. But we do some dry leasing, which helps with uh, the expenses. Yeah. You know, we'll do like dry leasing. We have a manager that handles all that. So we were discussing before this podcast about how you negotiate absolutely everything in your life, right? From cars to houses to the sentence that you're going to receive when you're 17 can you tell me other random stuff that you've negotiated you said you can negotiate for anything and people overlook that i mean i will try to negotiate and take advantage of anything you know i mean all right some places you can't you know but like you know if i'm in the grocery store and you know i really don't want to buy the kid that bag of candy they want i'll accidentally open it a little say, hey this is open can i get it for half price um you know, or we went to the buffet or the restaurant at the Bellagio and, you know, my niece is really 15, but I said she was 10. It was half price. That's smart. <laughs> I do that stuff. <laughs> she don't eat much. She eats the same as a 10-year-old. It shouldn't go by the age. It should go by size. You if you're a small person and you eat light, then you should be charged should by you, your weight. I should you pay double that? Him, they'll pay fucking 10 times the price of a buffet. I would, they fucking probably would cry if they saw you walk in a fucking buffet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Holy shit. I know some Chinese guys that would close their shop if they thought he was coming in there, coming to the Chinese buffet in my neighborhood. You know, my son got kicked out of a Chinese buffet once. Wow. No, he didn't. How do you he ate too fucking much. And uh, what, what did that go like for him? What, what happened was I put him in charge of a palm building when he was like 19. He drunk out of college. And I put, I said, go to this palm building. I'm not paying for your tuition no more. You're not doing shit in college. You fucked off the first year and party. Go work this building I just bought in Florida. And I, and I wasn't even living there yet. I already started buying palm buildings. So he goes to this palm building. So he's in there. He's managing the building. And every month you get all the rents, you know, all the time rents come in. Back then we didn't have, he did, I don't know why, but he was doing all my hand deposits back then. We're talking 2004. Mm -hmm. All right. He was doing hand deposits on the de ticket with all the rents and stamping the checks and all that shit. It's a lot of time writing the shit in the deposit ticket, stamping the check, getting the bank deposit ready to go. So what he would do is around the corner of the building was a Chinese buffet. <laughs> and he would come in there like around right before lunch was over, maybe like two o'clock or something like that. And then, you know, they, they, they were open, you know, through dinner. He come in here at 2 o'clock, and he's a big kid, you know. He can eat. And uh, and, and the, he goes, and he's sitting there doing his work. And he stayed there for hours <laughs> doing his work. And while he's working, he keeps going back and forth, eating. And the guy <laughs> goes, you come for lunch, you stay for dinner. You get out. <laughs> and he got kicked out. I had to go wow. there. Oh I had to go there and get the guy some money to let him come back in because he loved the place. Plus, he get his work done no. there. And he obviously wouldn't get shit done because he, you know, he had food nearby. We he would work. That is hilarious. That's now genius. They have but now they have, smart. they have time limits now. They all say yeah. 60 to 90 minutes. Yeah, this is back. I'm talking Always. 2004. I'm talking. That's smart. Yeah. <coughs> Jeez. I've never gone this long without a fucking cigarette. A lot of people commented about you smoking. And that was one of the most recurring comments that I got. When oh. are you going to quit smoking? You just brought up smoking. I will now. quit. When I die, it'll kill me. Seriously, I started yeah. smoking pack a day when I was 12 years old. Well, maybe it wasn't a pack of 12, but it was, I was smoking at 12. Yeah. Okay. And then by, I know by 16, 15, 15, 14, I know it's back a day. I remember the little Puerto Rican place I used to go to and get them to the bulletproof glass. And the guy would sell me a pack of Newports when I was 14, living in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. I've been smoking since I was 14 and, and it's very addictive and uh, I can't quit. If I quit, I'd probably kill people. But, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't think I even ever tried. You don't think you can? But I got a clean bill of health when I went to the Mayo Clinic with my lungs and everything. I don't think I quit. Hell no. It's a drug. It's addictive. It's nicotine. You That's know, it's like you trying quit. to quit heroin. It ain't going to happen. But, uh, if I keep trying, I... I, I bet you could. I think a lot of people are just genuinely concerned about your health. But my body might go into shock and say, what the fuck's going on? I ain't got no nicotine in me. It really kill me. Well, you could think do about that. 
Take yeah. like little nicotine patches. Oh, I tried. Like, I had patches. Yeah, I had so many yeah. fucking patches on and shit didn't work. And then you smoke while you got the patches on, you get really fucked up. I have given myself nicotine poisoning before. That's, That's when I know. Oh, well, I could feel it. I could say, okay, uh, I got I to gotta stop smoking <laughs> for at least five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's that feel like? What? Nicotine? Nicotine poisoning. <clears throat> it makes you sick. You know, you pretty much get sick to your stomach. You know, but I mean, I'm addicted to it. You know, and uh, what does it what does it feel like? I've never smoked a cigarette. Oh my never. god, like, it's what the is best. It? It's great. What is it? What is it? Let what me does tell it you, after like you have a like... fucking meal or you get laid, you gotta have a fucking cigarette. You haven't lived what, until you have. Well, and then if you have a menthol, really? and if you haven't had a menthol, you really haven't lived. But, I'm sorry. But what is it? What does it feel like? What is that though? Like how, how does it? You've never, like, have you ever got high? No, let's be honest. I, Come on, let's be honest. All right, I don't know. Yeah. You want to be honest or not? Be honest. All right. Have you ever got High? You know it's like smoking weed? I hated it. I, I smoked weed maybe t- two to three times in my right, life. Well, it's not your personality. School. I couldn't stand but it. But for the yeah. personality, the person that enjoyed me, oh, man, they enjoy it. But smoking cigarettes, it's it's an addictive habit. But it does relax me, it calms me down, gives me something, you know. I don't know. It, it's just part of me. And it may not be part of you, or it couldn't be part of you, but it's part of me. But I'm I don't just, like the smell of cigarettes. But I'm just trying to think, like, I what, like smoking but it. But the feeling and the sensation. I, okay, like, so what yeah. I would understand it it's is, a like, drug. is similar to yeah. caffeine. That's what I caffeine, think. Caffeine, you drink coffee? I do, I love coffee. Get, well, there you go, yeah. same thing. You get you get that kind of feeling. It's hard to explain. Yeah, you sure. get this feeling in the morning. When you wake up, do you need a cup of coffee? I do. Me too. I love it. Yeah. I wake up, my wife's got a cup right by my bed. I need it. It just it gets me going. It gets my brain going. The cigarette's the same thing. I, I can't believe I sat here this long without a cigarette. I mean, I can. You know, I go on airplanes. Shit, yeah. Maybe go to fucking Dubai. That took fucking 20-something hours in those cigarettes. And then what's the feeling like after, like, let's say an hour and a half, two hours? You haven't You're ready for cigarette. another one, baby. But uh, but how does it come <laughs> up? Is it just like just an urge where it's just like a... Just like, yeah, it's an urge. It? Hey, I'm going to have a cigarette. Let me tell you, if you're drinking alcohol, I don't drink. But yeah. uh, people that drink sometimes only smoke. I don't know how they do it. I have friends. They only smoke when they drink. I have friends like that. I lots of lots of people my right. age like they don't smoke casually, but if they drink, it's like they need a and cigarette. And then what's up with the whole new thing with the fucking vape? They, the I think they yeah. say that the he's a vapor. I can tell he's. A I'm vapor. not a vapor. You're no. a vapor. No, I've never had a cigarette, a and I don't. Vapor. I don't vape. Absolutely not. No. Yeah, and I, can I don't that. like. I don't yeah. smoke things. I don't smoke things. Ooh, I'm I'll, drink. No, I'll drink. I'll drink. Southern California. I'll drink. I don't oh, smoke things. Exactly. I'll, I'll suck on things, but I won't smoke things. No, I don't know. That's just. I, I, I get it. It kind of makes me nervous. Hey, listen, we're all human beings. We all have our different lives to live. You do whatever you know fits your lifestyle. I overeat. I'm trying to cut down on that because mm-hmm. I don't want to look like him. Um, <laughs> overeating, you know, eating, smoking, drinking, their vices. These are things. Everybody's an individual. You have a right to do what you want. But, you know, some people are drug addicts. Some people smoke too much pot. Some people smoke too much coke. Some people smoke crack. Some people shoot heroin. It goes on and on and on. And now we got pills. Pills you do. I know you're a pill popper. I don't do, I don't do drugs. <laughs> pills? Honestly, it's good you don't do drugs. You got enough problems already. <laughs> They're not going to help you. I mean, you know, it is what it is. You know, I grew up in an environment where everybody smoked around me, and I started smoking. Yeah. You know, a lot of it's a product of your environment when you're young. You know, that's why I tell my kids, if you hang out with losers, you're going to be a loser because, you know, you're a product of your environment. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I got another random question if you're comfortable answering. So you've had, what, two wives, three wives? I don't want to talk about too much about women. My wife is very jealous and hates the past. But anyway, I'm on my third wife. You got a this problem with that, buddy? No, 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 no. This doesn't have to be about your past relationships. I'm just curious because you've, but I'm done been, now. you've been through relationships. What have this you This is learned? the only real one. The one I'm in now is really the only one I consider a real relationship. Right, so I'm, but I'm sure through failures, you've learned a lot. I mean, right? I didn't have a quarter of those nights. What are you going to do? You didn't what? <laughs> you call? I didn't have a quarter of some of those nights. Oh, I had two okay. kids. I didn't, I didn't hear you. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But like, what have you learned? Like, what works I guess Jack's out? Jack's asking work? for relationship advice. Relationship advice. Just yeah. generic. You got to like, find somebody that matches you. Yeah. It's like if my wife was a go getter or money maker, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. I mean, it just wouldn't. Opposites actually do well. Mm. Attract. Okay, but it's whatever works for you. You know, if you, if you feel like you're compatible with somebody and you're attracted to them, it works. You just got to stay away from people that are going to hurt your life. 
My wife brought my life stability. My wife brought my life stability. She stayed at home. She took care of kids. She raised a family. She did all the things that I needed to do. She took care of me as a husband. Um, you know, I pay a price for it. I pay dearly, but uh, you know. Anyway, you know, but it worked for me. You know, I, I, I didn't. I, I, if I had a career wife, it wouldn't be the same. I wouldn't have the quality of life if I had a wife that wasn't worried so much about the quality of our life. So, you know, whatever fits your lifestyle, whatever your needs are, you know, <clears throat> you might want to go. I, by the way, I said earlier, this you might want to go to a mental hospital. I, I said earlier, <laughs> this podcast, I'm gay. I'm not gay. So I just wanted to, I forgot <laughs> to clarify that. You know, Listen, whatever makes, makes you happy, I don't care. No, no, hold on a it second. Was, I don't want people you don't have to, getting some <laughs> sort of idea. I want to tell them about the Instagram thing. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, being bi is still being gay. I'm not bi. No. <laughs> I want to I want to tell him about the Instagram thing. So right. I posted I think three years ago we were looking for a date for Jack in the podcast, and I posted on Instagram. I said, "DM Jack if you're single, you want to come on the podcast, be his blind date." Ninety percent guys. No, it was like all guys. It was all. I don't I don't even know if Actually, we got yeah, a single girl, and this was it was up for like twenty minutes. We got like yeah, but what's your audience? Your back. audience is mostly well, exactly. guys. Exactly, that's what I'm trying to say. Man. Okay, yeah. let's yeah. You can, it depends. I mean, you know, what kind of girl do you want? You know. What do you want? You want somebody who's educated? You want somebody who's a doctor? You could probably go pull a doctor if you want. There's plenty of women doctors out there. You know, you want a woman that's going to boss you around? What do you want? You want a woman that's going to cater all your needs or baby you? What do you want? You got to so find what you want. So you're saying figure out what do what you, it is like? you like? It's all about what you like. Then that somebody has to fit that piece in that puzzle. That's interesting. That's really a, a pretty simple advice. You have to. You're sense. creating your life when you get involved with somebody. They have to fit your life. They have to be the right piece for that puzzle. You know, and then you'll be happy. Huh. Hopefully. What do you want, Jack? Do you know? What do I want? Yeah, I don't. Like, as far as characteristics in a girl? Yeah. Like, well, I, I, they got to be fit, number person. one. I insist on a woman that's fit. No, I, that honestly doesn't matter that much to me. Honestly, the main thing is I, I like girls that are smart. Somebody that I can have like some good banter with, that for me is very important. I don't. You don't want someone that's smart? No. And that's crazy because I wonder, well, it's not crazy, it's just different. I'm smart enough for both of us. My wife, whenever we get into a fight, she always says, we, we, get, into, you know, we get into a fight, all couples do. I know, I know, you're the smart one. I'm the dumb one. I'm the dumb one. <laughs> and then what do you <laughs> say? What do you say to that? I don't say shit, she said it all. Oh my God. <laughs> can I ask what, what you guys fight about? Or like, what's, a, what's an it's Always stupid like shit stupid. or always other people. Yeah. The only problems we got in our relationship is other people. Other people, all the family members or this and that it's never us yeah. it's it's always some nonsense that has to do with somebody else that we shouldn't even be dealing with you know so that's why time- we started saying from now on the less we know about people are better you know just just whatever <laughs> we don't want to know is there anything else you wanted to mention while i'm here i mean you know i've been fired from every job i've ever had in my life yeah. the army they were willing to keep me but they weren't offering me a great deal you know and before i went in the army you know, I hung around with a bunch of, you know, in the neighborhood, you can't help it. You know, I lived in a bar in Brooklyn for a while when I was like 16. And it was the typical bar where all the goombas or whatever gangsters hung out. And then they had these, you know, apartments above them. That's yeah. the way it is in Brooklyn. So we lived in this apartment. It was just me and my sister at the time. We lived in an apartment over the bar. You know, you hang out in the neighborhood. You know, you ever see like the movies, uh, like Goodfellas with a kid who yeah, was, yeah, hanging sure. out, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, long story short, I started hanging out with some of the younger guys, you know, not the older guys, you know. And, and I hang around, and they'd get to see me around and say, hey, you know. And so I figured, what the hell, I ain't doing shit, I need to make some money. So I went in there, and the guy says, you know, the guy, his name was Chubby. He was, a, you know, Italian or whatever. He was like what they call the guy in that area that ran shit, you know, mm-hmm. captain, whatever you want to call him. And he's sitting in the back of the bar, and he was a loan shark. He'd loan people money, take bets. He was a bookie. And that was the guy you went to in that area if you wanted to borrow money or you needed to bet on a horse or whatever. So <clears throat> he didn't care for me for some reason, I think because he knew I wasn't stupid. You know, ignorant people don't like smart people, you know. It's just the way it is. You make them feel stupid, you know, as yeah. they are. So anyway, Chubby goes to me one day, and he says, hey, you know, go pay a visit to this guy. He owes me a 1000 bucks." And he, I guess the guy was a degenerate gambler. You know, he betted on horses and sports or whatever, and he owed Chubby the money. And uh, <clears throat> he tells me where the guy lives and everything. And so I go over there, and it was a similar type building, you know, shitty old apartments. And I knock at the guy's door, 
And I walk in there, and, you know, it was total. He had a big bottle of Cuddy Sark. I don't know if you've ever seen Cuddy Sark. It's a bottle of liquor. It, it was commonly drunk and back then, and he had a big bottle there, and he's sitting on those stupid folding tables. You ever see those stupid old tables you put out in front of the TV? Yeah, on sure, them? yeah. And he had a whole black and white TV with the fucking daubs nice. on it. We're talking back in, you know, 80s. With the rabbit ears and yep. shit, and he's sitting there, and he had a big belly with a white, white beaded T-shirt on. He was a slob, and it looked like a fucking wreck. And he was always drunk. So I come over there. I says, uh, "Hey, Chubby sent me over here. You know, you got any money for him?" Oh, you act like a tough guy. Oh, I ain't got no money. And he was, you know, he's just a real pain in the ass guy. I ain't got no money. And, 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 and act like a big shot, tough guy. Mm -hmm. Listen, who are you kidding? These guys are going to come over here and break your fucking arm if you don't pay him some money. Here, I felt, I almost felt sorry for the guy because I knew yeah. that if I came back with nothing, they were going to hurt this guy. Yeah. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> So I'm telling the guy, I say, listen, you got to have something or somebody. Call somebody. Call a relative. Give me something to go back to this guy with. Give me 500 bucks, 300 bucks, something. All right, give me something, you know, you got anything. No, I ain't got nothing. All I got is this beat up old fucking cutlass outside, you know, that ain't started, it ain't ran in years. Anyway, give me the keys. I was into cars, mm -hmm. okay? I hung out with Puerto Ricans. We'd take cars like that. Anyway, I had new friends that could fix a car and fix almost anything pretty much. So give me the keys to the fucking car. I like cars too. So yeah. I went down there, I looked at the Cutlass, and I was very familiar with Cutlasses because I've taken many of them. I borrowed many wow. of them. Okay. So fucking thing's dead. You know, I ain't been touched in a fucking year. I call my friend Edwin up. He's a Puerto Rican guy we used to hang out with. Edwin, come over here and help me, please. Take a look at this car. Maybe we can make some money on it. I don't know. Edwin comes over there, and we ended up changing the battery. I bought a used battery. It cost me like 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. We put oil in it. We put water in it. We put, He may have changed the spark plug or two or something like that. Edwin got the fucking thing started. And it wasn't that bad a shape. It was just stopped running, and the idiot just, you left know, in. just yeah. left it in care. He ain't going nowhere anyway. He ain't got no money going nowhere. So we get the fucking thing running. I got, Give me the fucking pay, title for it. He gives me the title of the car. I go to another place I know, the junkyards, and, you know, they bought cars like that. I go to the car, and it was actually a decent car once we put a fucking hose to it and got it running. So we go to the junkyard. The guy says, I'll give you a grand. The guy gives me a thousand bucks for the fucking car. Wow. I take the thousand bucks. I go back to Chubby. I give him the envelope with a thousand bucks in it. Yeah. Ten $100 bills. And he was totally just blown away. How the fuck did you get the money out of that deadbeat? He knew I couldn't get the money. He set me up yeah. to, to, to lose. He set me up for failure. So I give him the fucking money. How the fuck did you get the money out of that deadbeat? So I tell him the whole story. Well, you know, he said he had a car. I took the car. I went and bought a battery. Uh, we put oil in it. We put water. We fixed it up. My friend fixed it up. We took it. We sold it to another guy. He knew the guy I sold it to because they're all connected. Yeah. And I got a thousand bucks. And there you go. The guy sit there and he just listened to my story, looked at me, and he says, get the hell out of here. You're not right for this business. What? He wanted oh, me to man. hurt the guy. Oh, geez. And and then, yeah. and then I, because I went to all that trouble, yeah. I lost money. I bought the fucking battery and the water and the oh oil, whatever, gosh. or the water, but I, I ended up losing 50 bucks or 30 bucks, whatever it was in those days, to fix the fucking car to get him his fucking money back. And he says, get out of here. You're not right for this type of business. What? He'd rather wow. I hurt the guy or some shit. But he thought, he, he, he couldn't believe it. I went through all this trouble and figured out and went through all that to get his fucking money. It was like, it didn't make sense to him. Holy crap. Anyway, he saved my life. Yeah. So that was my mafia story. I never, never got, I always stayed away from those guys. That uh, happened for a reason. Jeez. That's it. Cool. I like that. Finding a silver lining wow. to a pretty crazy story. So. You never know it in the moment, but looking back, that is uh, remarkable. Yeah. That's it. Well, thanks so much, man. Thank really you. Appreciate it's been a blast. Thanks for having Vegas. us. Thanks, you don't bud. shake hands. You got to do this, do that. Do a punch, do this. All right. You got me. Yeah, all right. Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> Guys, check out Lexar, please, <laughs> right there. Well, please. Thanks, man. Hey, and by the way, if you want to see videos about real estate, what I'm doing every day, 
go to YouTube, Ben Mala. Check out hey, Life is Sale. Link down below oh, yeah. in the description. Or go to benmal.com slash shopping. Consult with Ben. You got a deal? You got a problem? Get me on the phone. Let's talk about it. Let's work it out. Well, thank you so much, we, man. We, yeah, we thank also, you, guys. Thank also, you.